Is this working? <laughs> Ah, is this working? <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, okay, there's a delay. I didn't know that, but ah. okay, now we know. <laughs> okay, hi it's working. Everybody. Okay, I'm reading the comments. Um, I'm like, okay, this is the first time I'm doing this. That, so, but ah. anything that goes wrong, okay, now we know. Uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> it's working. Okay, I'm reading the comments. Um, I'm like, okay, this is the first time I'm doing this. So, so I don't hear myself. Anything that speaking. goes wrong, okay, no, yeah, uh, there's a weird delay. <laughs> never mind. Uh, anyway, it's working. I'll figure that one out. Or maybe that's this is the first time I'm doing this. Maybe that's meant to be that way. Speaking. Yeah, there's a weird delay. Never mind. Anyway, I'll figure. Wait, you guys have hear a double voice the first time uh, I'm doing this. is that it's meant to be that way yeah um, there's a weird delay never I'm sure echo like 15 wait you guys have hear a double voice um is that why does anybody know why that is oh uh because I had the stream on myself never mind okay it, it should be gone now in a couple seconds when the delay is stopping is it good now is it fixed okay <laughs> yeah it's because i had the computer sound on but also my microphone never mind that okay um so this is the first time i'm doing a live thing so um i'm a bit nervous because normally i get to edit myself um and also, I, I keep watching like the stream, but I also watch it over in OBS. So it's like, it's a lot of multitasking. I do have someone helping me with the uh, questions um, because it's difficult for me to talk and then also read the comments. I'm going to read them all later um, once everything's done. I'll try to read them right now, but um, it's difficult if I'm in the middle of answering uh a question but I have someone also reading the comments and adding all of your questions to a Google sheet so that um, I don't miss anything um, it's funny that uh, when I scheduled this I didn't realize this but today 11 years ago is when I came to LA I believe this is when I um, got on the plane in Berlin and flew over to LAX. So it's also today, my 11 year anniversary, I think, in Los Angeles. So yeah, I guess we're celebrating that and we're celebrating almost coming up on 40,000 subscribers. So here we are. So I collected all the um, questions from the post that I made already, but you can still drop in questions in the live chat as well. I just wanted to have something to start with um, as questions are coming in. So I'm just going to quickly go through all the questions and I'll try to answer as much as I can before I have to go back to work um, today because it's still early morning for me. Um, so um, the, quest the first question I wrote down from the post is, as a media composer, I'm sure you're capable of writing in a wide variety of styles. Judging from the bits of music I've heard on your channel, it seems you're mostly writing or you're best known for old school orchestral scores. Is this the style you generally prefer? Um, it used to be, and I still love it, but it just kind of happened to be what I wanted to do at the beginning. And I got to do that, and that's very fortunate. But now, you know, after 10 years of doing that, I'm kind of at a point where I like to... Um, you know experiment a little bit more where I would like to um, just do other stuff a little bit more and I've gotten to do that this year which is um, really nice um, you know not just write the traditional old school orchestral scores because those really are only demanded in kids entertainment and animation and while I love doing that it's not the only thing I ever want to do so I'm kind of moving away from it a little bit and I try to start doing other things and dive into other genres and experiment more and find more of my own sound as well because the orchestra is really limited in terms of what you can do because it's been around for so long um, that, 
you know, almost everything has already been done. So there's very little new territory you can go into if you're writing tonal orchestral music. So, yeah. Anyway, next question was, what can composers do to help create and maintain a diverse community industry that empowers and protects women, people of color, etc.? That's a good question. Um, my big thing is, I mean, first of all, hire women. If you're in a hiring position, you know, consider women seriously and don't just, you know, a lot of the initiatives and a lot of those diversity programs that we have right now are a little virtue signaling, you know, they're, they're a lot of lip service, but then um, they're just kind of, you know, they don't really lead to anything and that's kind of sad. Um, so seriously consider women when you're looking for someone. And then the other thing is, if you see anything in the workplace, um, say something. Because we need the support of men in this as well. You know, especially if you're the minority in the room, it's very hard sometimes to say something if something's inappropriate or, you know, you want to say something, but, you know, you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to be difficult, you know, because you're the only person of your kind in the room. Um, it's always good if the majority speaks up, you know, it's always good if the majority of guys kind of sees things critically and educates themselves and, um, you know, starts to say shit, you know, so we don't have to, so we don't have to be difficult, you know, because if, um, if you guys make it clear that certain behavior is not going to be tolerated in the room, then it's much less likely by whoever is the problem to keep doing it. You know, if there's too much contra from, from too many people and they realize, okay, this is not socially accepted, then they're much less likely to do it. So we definitely need the support of guys, 100%. If you see something, say something, do something. Uh, don't just watch, you know. Don't just let it happen and assume that um, the person themselves can always speak up because we're not always in the position to do that. Um, next question I have. What do you advise for composers that are still trying to find their sound or originality? How did you find your musical voice? I don't actually think I found my musical voice. I think I'm still looking for it, to be honest. Because... Um, Something I think we all do at the beginning is we want to copy our heroes, right? We want to copy the people that we love the most and we want to sound like that person and we explore that and we kind of copy it and rip it off and just kind of, you know, have fun with it. And then eventually it gets old and that's kind of when you start to explore new things and you kind of just go, oh, um, maybe I should venture into unknown territory. Maybe I need to get out of my comfort zone. What that looks like is kind of up to everybody, but there's nothing wrong with first spending some time copying your heroes and exploring what they've done so that you can then figure out what you want to do. Um, and I feel like that's where I'm at now. That's where I've been at for the last two years, I think, to kind of stop looking so much at other composers that I admire and start to sit down with myself a lot more and go but what do I want to do if I didn't know these soundtracks what would I actually do if I just erase the knowledge of those people and their scores um, so I think it'll just come naturally if you practice and if you keep doing the thing you will naturally find things that you like find things that you will continue to do and then that will slowly develop into your sound. But that's not something you can force. It's just something that naturally happens from probably first um, copying other people <laughs> and then venturing out of that or, you know, putting a spin on on what you learned from those people. So it's a natural process that really only kind of helps 
uh, or that only happens if you really practice and you really do the thing every day, then inevitably you will stumble upon things. And, you know, actively experiment, actively um, actively just try things out that don't necessarily have to lead to anything. You can just, you know, do a thing without having to sell it or without having to uh, make it commercially viable. So, yeah, take your time and venture out of your comfort zone to find things that resonate with you that maybe nobody else has done before or that at least nobody else has done in that combination. All right, next question. When you deliver stems to a dub mix, um, is there a typical loudness to aim for? So usually most film composers don't deliver straight to the dub mix. We deliver to a score mixer and then the score mixer takes care of all that. Um, if we deliver directly to the dub mix, I just make sure that it's a proper loudness, but it's not mastered. Um, so you want to leave a bit of headroom and you, you, know, you don't want to max everything out. I just want it to be a proper volume um, because they're going to drag it down by like 12 dB anyway at the dub stage. So that's kind of what I go for, that it's still nicely audible when you drag it down by 12 dB. But um, I don't aim for a specific loudness. Are you able to give a career update? Also, are the strikes having any impact for you? Um, not currently, um, in terms of the strikes. Uh, that's because I'm currently working on a bunch of European productions and I'm mostly working on video games. Um, and my other movies are already done for the year. So the strikes don't currently have an impact, but they will have an impact. It's, it's starting to have an impact on other composers because some assistants have already been let go because a lot of the bigger composers, you know, don't have stuff to work on. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's going to be some major work gap uh, next year because we're currently anticipating the strikes to go on until the end of the year. We thought it would be done by Labor Day, but it probably won't be done because uh, they have not found an agreement yet. So the strikes will probably go on until the end of the year, potentially. And then there will just be a real shortage of work for post-production next year. Because right now you still have a couple of things in post-production um, and composers are working in post-production. So there's still some leftover work to do. But once that runs out, um, it's going to be tricky. And especially, um, you know, I also heard that some productions even though they are in post-production uh, they're also on hold because they need ADR lines from the actors and the actors are on strike and so if there are you know hundreds of ADR lines missing then they can't finish the mix or the project so um, that's where they're at right now. Uh, career update I've been working on a VR game I don't think it has been announced yet so I can't say what it is um, and I have done a collaboration with Christopher Leonards on a Christmas movie that's going to be on Disney Plus later this year. I've also done another Christmas movie for Hallmark that's coming out later this year. And currently I'm working on a war drama that I think is going to be released early next year. Um, but so the VR game has been taking up most of my time because <laughs> I'm scoring that all by myself and... Uh, it's it's a lot of hours of music so um but yeah i'll announce it once uh they announce the game but so far they have not announced it i keep checking every day i thought they might announce it at gamescom but uh, i don't think they did so um all right when creating themes that are based on a simple idea they must be sent for production approval correct this means they should be fully developed tracks with orchestration, atmosphere, and instrumentation choices that enhance the main idea. Later, when implementing the themes and theme variations, how committed are you to the original theme tracks and these extra elements? In other words, when sending the theme tracks for approval, are the tracks themselves considered to be the theme which you would later use? Yes, they are considered the theme which I would later use. 
Um, which isn't to say that I'm not going to vary the theme, but the theme that I'm sending off or the theme suite that I'm sending off at the beginning is going to be uh, definitely the thing that we're going to use. Like you can't really change stuff later on because once you're scoring to picture, you really want to know that you're scoring with stuff that has been approved already by the production. Otherwise, you're going to just rewrite shit over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, you would send fully orchestrated, fully mocked up versions and then they approve it. And usually I write the themes with already a scene in mind that that theme can go with in its original form. So usually that would be the first scene that I'd also be scoring so that I can use the theme as it is. Um, yeah. And then in other scenes, you just readapt it. All right, oh, let me move over. Um, all right, next question. What advice do you have for getting a career started in film and TV composing when you are in a small town and not likely to relocate to LA? Are film scoring competitions helpful for getting your foot in the door or not so much? It's a funny thing since I'm working with David. I would say no. Um, I think film scoring competitions is like playing the lottery and it's not super useful but I think David might have a different opinion on that so uh, I don't know uh, I personally have never found it very helpful um, what advice do I have for getting a career started from outside of LA I don't know I've never worked outside of LA um, and most composers are in LA. We're actually currently compiling a document with composers DAWs and location. And first of all, there's not a lot of us. I'm really shocked by just how few there are. And then um, we came up with like 140 composers, working composers um, in film, TV and games. I mean, there's more. We probably forgot a bunch. But like 130 out of the 140 are like in LA. I guess when you're outside of LA, I would look at what's the next bigger city, where's the next um where's the next uh film festival or you know, game conference or anything like that. Um so th that might work. But yeah, it's difficult if you're this is a very niche profession. Um there's not much you can do this is not like any other profession that you know you could just do anywhere there's only like what a thousand working composers maybe um and they're all kind of almost all in bigger cities with a strong media presence so i would look into that or library music i guess library music is not very location dependent so um, that's something you can do from pretty much anywhere. But other than that, it's always about making genuine connections. But how do you make genuine connections if you're not where the filmmakers are? I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. <laughs> Which is why I came to LA, because I was like, well, it's going to be London or LA, I guess, when I was studying, because I was like, where else am I going to find the work? And not that it's impossible to find work elsewhere people have done it but I don't know how <laughs> I wouldn't know how next question how did the system or workflow you use evolve over time how did you start finding a productive workflow and do you use different workflows for different projects or stick to the same workflow regardless of the project or projects you're working on um so yeah, my workflow slowly evolves over time with the tools that I use, but it doesn't fundamentally change. The way I developed it is I was an assistant for several years for a variety of composers. And so what I did was essentially look at what I thought worked really well and what I thought didn't work really well, because almost all composer studios that I've worked on, they have a similar workflow, not exactly the same workflow, but it's very, very similar because um, the same tasks need to get done. 
And so I would basically look at it and be like, well, this is actually the most efficient way of doing it. I don't like how they did this, so I'm not going to take over that for my own workflow. And I basically slowly piece together my own workflow, um, you know, to figure out what works best for me and for my setup and the way I like to work. So, yeah, my whole workflow is basically a, a puzzle together version of what I've learned as an assistant, basically. Um, and then different workflows for different projects, just mildly different, depending on whether I deliver straight to a dub stage or whether I deliver to a score mixer. And then the gaming workflow is quite different because for the most part, you're not writing to pictures. So there's a lot of that that isn't happening. And there's a lot of um, loops and a lot of version numbers and that sort of thing and layers that are happening that aren't necessarily happening in film and TV. So game workflows are slightly different. And also the deliveries are different. Um, very much so. How do you deal with director producer notes without wanting to burn your studio down? Um, it's communication. It always comes down to communication. Um, it is funny because I've recently actually left a project just like a week or two ago. Um, or like maybe a little longer ago. I don't remember. Um, because it was just chaos, you know, and they kept giving opposite notes and the communication was just so bad that eventually I was like, you know, this is no longer worth my time. I'm just going to step away from this project. You can give it to someone else. Someone else is going to happy, going to be happy to have it. But for the most part, I don't do that. Um, I don't mind notes in general. If they make things better or if they fit better with the vision of the director or producer um you know if there's a point to it i don't mind it um the thing that bothers me sometimes is more that um you know when they randomly change their mind or they just really don't know what they want and then you just have all this extra work the way i deal with that is i make a playback session a lot of composers do that they make like a playback session inside pro tools and then um, you play through the temp music and you play through the music you've done and you kind of A, B it and you ask them a lot of questions. And sometimes I will also drop in new temp music or other music that I think might work and just kind of test out what they like and ask them very specific questions about instruments and pacing and, you know, do you like this element? Do you like that element? because sometimes they just don't know how to express exactly what they want. And so I just ask a million questions in the playback session and just go, you know, like once we reach version three of something, I know we're not necessarily on the same page and we need to communicate better. And that's basically when I set up these playback sessions and go, okay, let's figure this out. Let's drop in a bunch of music, pre-existing music, Let's A, B this and let me ask you a million questions so I can actually figure out what it is that you want. Um, so that's how I deal with that. But any other notes, I mean, that's just part of the job. And there's very few pieces of music that I'm really married to. Because the more music you write, the less you're married to every individual piece. You know? Um, so it's not a big deal to me. Which living composer would you most want to work with? And which composer of all time? I don't know. I don't think I would want to work with anyone at this point anymore, other than collaborators I actually like, um, or working with my friends. Because um, I got to work with a bunch of composers that I admired and that I grew up with. And like half the time, it's a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> the other half of the time, it's enjoyable. You know, it's like, but I'm not at a point anymore where um, I would want to like be someone's apprentice or anything. I'm on the path to finding my own voice and my own journey in this career. So I don't, 
I don't know if there's anyone I would, I would love to hang out with a bunch of people and just ask them a bunch of questions, but I don't know if I would want to work with them because that's always such a huge difference. Um, there are so many composers that I like hanging out with, but then when you see them at work, you're like, I wouldn't want to work with them. <laughs> so um, there's a bunch of composers I'd love to hang out with and just ask them questions and just have a, you know, have a beer. Um, but collaboration, I would rather keep that to my friends and people I like and people I enjoy collaborating with. That's usually the better way to go because you can work with someone you admire, but if it's not enjoyable, it just sours the whole experience. And not only that, it just kind of also for the future sours your listening experience whenever you listen to that person's music. I don't know. It's like, you know, they say, don't meet your heroes. And there's some truth to that. So I would rather just enjoy their music from a distance instead of working with them. Because that can sometimes not be super enjoyable. How do you take care of your hearing health? Do you set break times using he headphones? Um, first of all, I go to the doctor. <laughs> go to your checkups, guys. <laughs> Uh, have your hearing checked every year or every six months or something um, and then I make sure yes I do take a lot of breaks uh, and I also don't go above a certain volume and also it helps that I'm using open ear headphones so there's not a lot of pressure or heat or anything on the ears so that helps but yeah if I know I'm listening at a pretty high volume I definitely take breaks like every half hour or so I just take five to ten minutes um, so yeah take a lot of breaks I have to take a lot of breaks anyway I'm not super good at being focused for too long I'm really good at being hyper focused for an hour or two but then I really do need a break so I don't know that's just me what exactly does it take to become a highly respected, financially secure and at least reasonably famous media composer? And what can a modestly talented older hobbyist with a short attention span like myself do to get around that? That I don't know. Therapy, maybe. I don't know. Um, that's kind of for everybody to figure out themselves. Like I have my own issues that I need to figure out, you know, like my own motivation issues or you know just things that keep you from doing the thing effectively and you just have to figure out what whatever works for you to get over that um, either with the help of other people or by yourself whatever works for you uh, I wouldn't know how you become a highly respected financially secure reasonably famous media composer tell me when you figure it out <laughs> um, I do the work do the work is probably the that's also why I always say at the end of my composition videos go practice do the work put in put in the work and get good <laughs> which that's the most useless advice to ever be. get good um, but practice, practice, Th that's, I think, the biggest thing. Because, you know, practice is way more important than talent or anything else. Um, and, you know, figure out how your personality and how your style fits into this industry and where it fits into it. Because at the beginning, I really tried to be liked by everyone and to fit into every area and do every genre and you know I try to be everything and what I've realized over time is you don't have to be everything you really only have to find your people your crowd that resonates with you that you want to hang out with that you want to collaborate with everyone else doesn't really matter and you just have to do the music that you want to do and find your niche where that fits into the industry um and then just specialize in that and be hired for you. Because that's usually how people are hired to begin with. You're not hired necessarily because of your music. You're hired because of the whole package. 
because of your management skills, because uh, you're, you know, not a dickhead, you know, um, you're, you're good to work with, you're easy to work with, you're level headed, you deliver on time, like there's all these technical things, you know, your production quality, your writing style, your own voice. There's so many things, you know, that are tied to both your creativity, but also your business acumen and your personality that figuring all these things out and knowing yourself really well and then knowing who your crowd is finding that crowd and fitting in with that crowd is I think way better than trying to do everything or trying to fit in everywhere so I guess that would be my main advice <laughs> financially secure I mean we just talked about the strikes nobody's financially secure anymore except like the top 20 30 composers in the world anyway so <laughs> so that's that um and there's something i guess to be said about integrity because things will always come back to you you know if you don't treat people right it will eventually come back and bite you in the butt so treat people right um all right, next question. Do you give feedback, feedback on people's compositions and mock-ups? No, I don't. Not outside of a, an educational context because I don't have the time. And personally, I also don't love giving feedback to begin with. Um, I never liked that very much. Because um, what the hell do I know? You know? Like, there's working composers, and I don't think... Like their music is very good, which is just my opinion and it doesn't matter what I think, you know, and that's kind of the point here. There are people that are highly successful and I'm like, but that's not great music. That's not, I don't like that. And then I remember that it doesn't really matter if I like it or not. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter if I think they're skilled or not. It doesn't matter if I like their production quality or if I like their music or how they scored something. It's about their collaboration with their filmmakers and I have nothing to do with it. So if they did their job and everybody on the filmmaker side was happy, they did their job right. And what I think is completely irrelevant. So, you know, so much of it is taste and just what the filmmakers wanted. So. I just don't love giving feedback on other people's work because clearly I'm wrong often enough. So, I mean, there are even highly respected, you know, pop artists and I listen to them so much and I just don't get it, you know, but that's just me. Clearly it's resonating with hundreds of millions of people. So again, what the hell do I know? Clearly nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't love giving feedback, but also I don't have the time to do it. So, um, and also most people really don't want feedback. They just want a pat on the back and I'm not here for that. <laughs> um, next question. I've read somewhere that after receiving a bachelor's degree at Artes, you went to UCLA to finish your studies. <clears throat> Was the bachelor's not enough? And if it wasn't, how come you didn't do the master's degree at Artes and then move to LA afterwards? Did UCLA offer something more than Artes? And if yes, what would that be? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, back when I was at Artes, I was the first year to um, do the film scoring program at the location that I was at. So <laughs> the program at the time was a little half-baked. It's been over 10 years now, so, you know it's developed into something else now um, and I thought I got a lot of good education in terms of music theory and a lot of good education in terms of you know just all the bread and butter counterpoint orchestration and all that stuff but a lot of it was not yet geared at film scoring specifically because the program was just so young at the time and uh, UCLA, basically, it offered the location, Los Angeles. It offered lessons by professionals, 
that are working in this particular industry. So it was geared towards film scoring. And then it also, obviously it gives you a visa and then you have a one year work permit as well because my goal was I really wanted to, at least for a short time, work under other composers and learn from them. But, you know, like I said, most of them are here. So this was kind of the location to, you know, have a chance of doing that. Um, and then also UCLA offers paid internships. I don't know if they still offer that, but it, they did when I did it. So you can um, already, while you're studying for several years, you can also do paid and unpaid internships as well. So I really wanted to make use of the location of learning from real composers, both at UCLA, but also doing internships and assistantships with real composers. Because honestly, in like three months on the job, I want to say I learned more than in four years of study. <laughs> Which is also why I never really tell people, unless you want to go into academics and teach, I would not say get a master's degree. Uh, because you learn way more on the job than you do in school. School is really nice for the basics, but then to actually learn workflow and the reality of the job, I would just go do the job and learn on the job. Also, school here is expensive. Don't do that. Don't go heavily into debt for studies to begin with because the pay is quite shit at the beginning. So, And there's no guarantee that it will ever be better. So there's no guarantee you can ever pay back your student loans. And a lot of people had to quit this entire industry because they were drowning in student loans um, and had to give it up and do something else. So don't recommend that. Don't... Don't burden yourself with a lifelong debt just to get a degree. Because I don't think anyone's ever looked at my degree. <laughs> so I don't think anyone's ever asked for that. So that's that. Do you always start your composition process with a main theme or is it sometimes an intro or ostinato or which I, on which the idea is based? Not really an oston ostinato or intro. If it's... A melody based score I do start with the melody with the themes definitely I just pace around and hum things to myself and record them on a voice memo um, if it's not theme based then I'm working a lot more with finding chords and sounds and designing synth patches or going through like a ton of synth presets and kind of picking the ones I like and then modifying them and really finding the sound palette and just compiling the sounds. Um, but yeah, beyond that, it would be melody first, I guess. And that's how I, w it's not like this is the right way of doing it. That's just how I do it. All right, next one. How do I get projects? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe create your own projects um partially i've started doing that and a lot of composers have started doing that just for for the fun of it but yeah um it's all about genuine connections i think um either by working with other composers that can then help you on your journey or working with young filmmakers um contact film schools contact animation schools contact anyone working in film, contact music supervisors, music editors, film editors, uh, anyone you can. Look on IMDb, look at what is in production right now, what is in pre-production, figure out if they already have a composer, maybe meet with those people if you can, maybe send them a demo or a reel. Um, if you have an agent, obviously your agent can also help you with pitches and such and kind of put your name out there, but that's kind of for later when you usually already have a steady flow of projects. Um, but yeah, other than that, go to game conferences, connect with indie game makers. Um, yeah, and indie filmmakers. Try, try to find those people and try to hang out with them, try to go to their screenings, try to make genuine connections. And then work with them, do a good job. And then usually, usually once you have your foot in the door, 
things kind of go smoothly because like after I had my first one or two jobs, things just kind of fell into place because people would recommend you. So I didn't actually have to apply for a lot of the jobs that I got just because it was someone I had already worked for putting in a word for me at another studio and then that studio hiring me based on the recommendation. And so, you know, that's kind of how it goes. And, you know, you have returning filmmakers, returning game clients, and you just, and they recommend you further to their colleagues. So once you have a network, it will naturally start expanding. Um, getting that going is the hard part. And usually the way you do it is by finding young filmmakers uh, who are just starting out, who are in need of composers, doing student projects and doing, you know, I know someone who contacted like an animation school, you know, and was like, hey, can I score all the short films you guys make for your um, final animations? Uh, so, you know, or like the Klaus family movies, for example, that I got. I scored the director's master thesis. He did a short film for his master thesis and reached out to me because, I don't know, he saw my stuff online somewhere, um, reached out and was like, do you want to score the short film? And then a year later, he contacted me again and was like, well, now I have this Netflix Christmas movie. <laughs> you want to do that too? So, you know, or like the war drama I'm working on right now. I did a short film with this director, I think 10 years ago. So it took a long time actually for that to develop further. But, um, you know, these things take time and just, and, and some of these things also go nowhere. I've scored short films that really went nowhere. And the filmmakers never ended up making anything else. And that's that happens too. That's fine. I mean, you don't just, you know, bet on, on one person. You try and collaborate with a lot of people. And then some of them are going to work out and some of them will not. Uh, but it takes a lot of groundwork at first. A lot of, you know, a lot of footwork to get those initial connections. Um, but yeah, IMDb good place to look for stuff, good place to look for connections. Sometimes what I also do is IMDB will show you what connections you have in common with other people. And so I will then have those other people put in a recommendation for me so that there's already an introduction with a mutual connection instead of me just cold emailing someone. Because cold emailing and cold calling doesn't often work. But if you come in with a mutual connection, that's usually a little easier. So yeah, I guess that that's what I'd recommend. And then, you know, put your put your work out there as well. Put your um, put your stuff on YouTube, maybe make a YouTube channel. I've gotten plenty of work through my YouTube channel, interestingly. Um, you know, be on social media and be present, you know, on at least one or two social media platforms, connect with people there. Um, so that there's a sense of familiar familiarity when they talk to you. Um, join composer groups on Discord or um, on Facebook or threads or whatever, wherever people hang out these days, I don't know. Um, you know, but be present online and be active online and share your work. You know, maybe self-publish a bunch of stuff, maybe publish an album on all digital platforms you can do that through DistroKid or CD Baby or any of those distribution services but put your work out there so that people can actually find you because I want to say a good third of my gigs came from people just randomly finding me on the internet so it does happen strangely all right what are the differences in producing composing a track for film versus for the soundtrack album uh, are soundtrack album tracks always used one-on-one -on -one in the film or vice versa? No. Um, usually the soundtrack album is kind of curated. It's usually a bunch of edits from tracks from the actual score. Um, and they don't always appear exactly that way in the film. Because in the film you're writing very much to picture and you also will repeat yourself a bunch of times and... You know, not every cue is soundtrack album worthy. <laughs> There's stuff under dialogue that is just not going 
gonna be on the soundtrack album you know there's just cues where it's like they work in the film but they're not really like a standalone listening experience so those are cut out any any duplicate tracks that are too similar are cut out and then you basically create larger tracks from the music that you have um that you're left with and some some cues stay exactly the same way like if there's a big opening sequence or something and it works really well as a standalone track i will leave it just like that but then a lot of the other tracks are just kind of edited together versions and often we also remix them a little bit to sound better in a standalone context so it's a different process to create music that works in the film with dialogue and with the edit and with the sound effects and all that and that tells a story under picture and to create a standalone listening experience on a soundtrack album all right then the last pre-recorded a uh, pre pre question i had oh, we're already 45 minutes in jesus all right uh i'm curious about how you react when you listen to a piece of media or music and feel inspired by it for me someone more limited that ends up being a little bit of transcription and just being in awe for someone more experienced like you how do you go about converting this feeling of inspiration from other music into your own music oof that's a good question depends on what it is if it's a chord progression i like then i will just sit down at the piano and just try and figure out the chord progression figure out what exactly about it it, it is that i like because usually it's just one specific element or maybe i like the orchestration then i will um, sit down and maybe try to make a mock-up of it to kind of figure out the orchestration or if it's someone i know i will reach out to them and just ask for the sheet music or the midi um and if it's specific sounds i will just start experimenting or i will ask colleagues and i'll be like how did they make the sound like what could this be and then you know very often they can point me to something that is you know inspired like a plugin or a specific processing chain uh, or a youtube video <laughs> that i can learn from um so it really depends on what it is but yeah a lot of it is um then sitting down and really trying to figure out what's going on and why do i like it that's always the big question for me like what is it about this thing that is resonating with me um and then trying to incorporate a version of that in my future work not exactly that but trying to figure out if i were to use this kind of thing how would i use it how would i give it my own spin all right now from the live comments jesus you guys are very active in the chat i did not expect this um what do you do in vienna synchron stage no i uh i mean i did visit the synchron stage beautiful stage and i hope to record there in the coming year or two um but that was more of a tour and me asking questions about stuff um and also kind of looking behind the scenes of vsl and all that stuff so that was super fun um but that was on my last day in vienna i was uh there to give a hollywood music workshop for a couple of days so i was there for like nine or ten days giving the workshop for three days and then giving private lessons and then i stayed a little longer to hang out with family and then also visit the synchron stage and you know go around vienna a little bit and beautiful city highly recommend going there if you ever have the chance there's so much old architecture that is just amazing and so beautiful um then the next one is there any website or online resources that you'd recommend to find film score gigs or to connect with directors yeah imdb discord social media is kind of or directly reaching out to film schools and animation schools and general, you know, wherever they learn their craft. Go hang out there. Um, I was wondering, is it possible to get a part-time composer's assistant job? I'm trying to branch out more, but I'm not able to hang up my current job completely. 
Um, most composers won't do that um, because they will need full-time help or at least people who are available on call. Um, what some people do is they will work for multiple composers freelance at the same time. I used to do that as well, where you just at different studios on different days. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any composers that do like that, that would do part time composer assistant jobs while you're working another job completely. I don't know. I don't really have a good answer to that. I haven't really seen it done all that much. What's your PC specification? Uh, CPU, RAM, SSD. Um, I have two computers. Um, I think my host still only has like 64 gigabytes of RAM. And then the Vienna Ensemble Pro Machine has 128 gigabytes of RAM. Bunch of SSDs, I don't know how many or how many terabytes. Um, and then CPU. I have an i9 in the in my host and an i7 in the in my server computer. I don't know exactly which ones. It's not the fastest fastest ones, but they are very much up there for sure. Um, my host has a stronger CPU because it needs to do the video processing, but also it also has a snazzier graphics card because I do gaming on that PC. Um, and also, uh, it's the one running all the synthesizers and plugins and stuff. So it needs a little bit more CPU power. Um, have you ever recorded at the synchron stage? Not yet, but it's, it's the plan, uh, in the near future. How do you save your template after finishing a project? I hit save. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, how do you save your template? I mean, the template is saved first. You work with the template. Um, and then if I made consistent modifications in the template or I noticed some, um, some issues in my template or something I want to change or there's like a routing mistake or whatever uh, or something I want to add, then usually during a project, I just write that down on a list because uh, I don't like changing my template in the middle of a project because then I have to remember which are already the new template and which are the old template and it, it, it gets messy. Um, so I try not to change it too much during a project, um, but I do take notes and then once the project is done, I open up my blank template and then I uh, make all the adjustments and then save a version of it usually with a date on it, so I know which one is the latest template, but I do keep all of my old templates as well, just in case. I probably never need them again, but you know, whatever. What is your favorite chord? I don't know, E minor? I certainly write a lot in E minor. <laughs> so maybe that's my favorite key, but I don't have a favorite chord, I don't think. Um, I would like to know what brass library is the one you use currently. I still use Cinebrass a lot and Cinematic Studio Brass combined. And then a little bit of Symphobia Brass. I haven't really upgraded my brass in a while. I kind of want to try out the Junkie XL Brass. Because I don't think I have anything like that. Like the, Cinesamp, like the Cinebrass Monster Low Brass is kind of similar. But... If I'm doing more experimental stuff and a little more, you know, serious and big stuff, maybe the Junk XL brass might be a nice addition. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with the brass I have, so I don't feel like I need anything. Um, got any tips for someone trying to get into the video game or film industry as a composer? We already went over that. Um... Could you picture a career ladder for film composers starting from entry level to a triple A class composer? I wish. Uh, it's actually something I want to do in the future. I just talked to someone about that. I would love to go back to what we used to have, which was kind of an apprentice system 
where you would start out as a runner and then there would be an actual kind of ladder as you work your way through a composer studio and it would really be like an apprenticeship and then when you graduate you do like a co-write with the lead composer and then you go off and have your own career that doesn't happen as much anymore um so that's that has become a bit of an issue um but also outside of that you know usually after like 10 years or after um you know after a certain amount of credits you would you know gradually get bigger projects and it doesn't happen like that anymore i'm not entirely sure the studios are very much currently run by um, managers you know and not necessarily creatives and they're very risk averse and so they just keep hiring the same people over and over again I find this to be a lot more doable in games. Like even though I've just started entering games a lot more last year, I find there's much more of a path um, where they look at your track record, they look at what you've done and they look at, you know, the entry level stuff you've done and then they give you something bigger and then they give you something bigger and then they give you something bigger than that. It seems more linear. The film career is just not linear at all unfortunately um like it's really and the higher you get on the ladder um the thinner the air gets so yeah i i don't really see it happening in film that much anymore that there's like a linear path going building on a career of things um, cause you know, they just had me last year, they just had me, uh, a big studio had me pitch on like a Christmas movie. I've scored seven Christmas movies, you know, you would think that at this point they could just take my word for it or just take my credits for it, you know, that I know how to score a Christmas movie, but there's just so little trust. I don't know how we're going to move forward from that. And how we're going to get over that. But I think the main difference is that in games, the audio side of things is actually run by composers or by audio music producers, by audio professionals. And so they're not as scared hiring a talent that they just like, even if it's, you know, unproven talent or just like semi-proven talent. They're a lot more open to finding new talent and making schedules that accommodate experimentation and maybe going in the wrong direction you know and you know trying out new people and and fostering new relationships and giving people a shot um i see that a lot less in film unfortunately especially on the studio level uh, they're just so risk averse they just default back to what they know every single time which is also how we keep ending up with the same movie over and over again because they just want to work with the same people and keep making the same movie. And personally, I currently find the game industry actually more exciting because um, they're a lot more interested in creativity and in trying out new things and innovating. And it's also a faster growing industry. So, yeah, anyway. Um, how do I start learning how to spot? Um, maybe learn under a music editor because they're usually doing the spotting anyway um but watching movies i guess understanding why music is coming in and why where it's going out and and why it's doing what it's doing um you have to study the craft which in this case you do by just watching a ton of movies and um, actively watching, not just watching them for enjoyment, but watching them, you know, academically in a way, you know, with your analytical brain and, and figuring out why it is the way it is and why it works or maybe also why it doesn't work. And then you kind of get a feel for it when music needs to come in and when it needs to go out. You can also often feel it if you watch your movie without music, you can kind of feel where it's missing. 
But spotting is also a collaboration between you and the director or the editor or the music editor. So it's not just you deciding stuff. It's usually a bunch of people weighing in on what should happen. And sometimes it changes after the fact. Sometimes we wanted music somewhere and then we actually cut that out later because we realize when we see the whole thing, it actually didn't need music or we move the music somewhere else because it works better somewhere else. So it's not set in stone. You can always try out a lot of things. Uh, in your opinion, what is the minimum that a budding bedroom composer would need setup wise in terms of hardware software? I don't have any professional aspirations. I mean, if you don't have any professional aspira aspirations, you don't really need anything. <laughs> it's probably not the answer you're looking for. Um, I mean, a powerful computer, because to me, nothing is um, nothing is more annoying then I used to work on these really weak computers and having to, you know, bounce things into audio and, you know, working with a computer that just can't realize my ideas. Um, and then just like get a medium size. I mean, you could just get, I guess, Composer Cloud or something and get that. If not that, I would get Contact and then whatever libraries you like and then one ah, maybe reverbs aren't even that important because most DAWs come with really good plugins these days um, I personally like to invest in the isotope structure infrastructure but or fab filter some people prefer but you don't even need that because logic and cubase and all the DAWs come with really good plugins you know so I would what I would do first is use all of those plugins and then see which ones have shortcomings that you don't like and then replace those plugins with <coughs> with um, professional plugins or, you know, like paid extra plugins, whatever you want to call them. But first I want to, I, I would use what you have in the DAW and see which one is actually good enough and which ones you you want better versions of do you prefer working on games and if so why i currently do prefer working on games yeah um it's a bit of a more humane environment interestingly uh people seem to care a lot more even at bigger game studios people care there's so many creatives in the room you know it's like i said with film very often there's, unless it's an indie film where you're directly working with a director or, you know, the creatives in charge and it's really their baby um, and they really care deeply about the movie, you're often working on stuff where people don't care as much and where it's just managers and handlers in the room, business people in the room that just, you know, are interested about getting it done, putting it out there, making money and checking it off of their to-do list. It's just like another item of shit they need to get done. And with games, I just don't have that feeling. It feels like you're in the room with mostly creatives. There are business people too, but they mostly step away and just deal with contracts and paperwork and payment and that sort of thing. But um, for a lot of those uh, collaborations, you're really in the room with creatives, with other audio creatives, with other music people with sound designers with you know the writers the game designers and you're playing the game together and it's just kind of it's so much more collaborative in a way because they're also usually much more interested in your creativity and your voice in experimentation they have these drawn out schedules where you get to experiment a lot they also pay better by the way that too i mean it's a buyout so there's that but so no royalties, but, um, uh, you know, the upfront pay is significantly higher usually than with movies. But, you know, they also, they're interested in <laughs> work-life balance. <laughs> you know, here in LA, in the film industry, it's like, they just expect you to work day and night and they don't care if it's a Sunday night and you're out at a concert or something. They will still call you 
and expect you to get back to work y you could be in your hospital bed and they would still call you and be like hey can you deliver this file you know with the game industry it feels more um corporate in a, in a way but in a good way you know in the way that they're more interested in like you sticking to your hours and taking weekends and working bankers hours and having a life and taking your vacation time and checking in with you to make sure you're not overworked and all this stuff. So, so far, I've had very little crunch in games. It's very relaxed and very creatively fulfilling to do that. And everyone is so excited about what they're making that you can't help but also be super excited about what you're making. And I just love the creativity that they allow me to have and just how long I get to work and revise stuff and really just um, expand on ideas and just have that freedom, you know? With, with film, very often you just don't have any freedom or not a lot of freedom to begin with, unfortunately. I need coffee. All right. Um, I keep trying to read the chat, but there's so much. <laughs> there's so many messages. It's crazy. Um, all right. Next question. Um, where, where was I? Oh, here. Uh, my question is regarding QA's load times. My projects take forever currently. I noticed you use MIDI tracks. Could you explain your template and how to load large libraries as quick as possible? Uh, I don't load the libraries. I have the libraries sitting on a separate machine inside Vienna Ensemble Pro, so I don't load the libraries. If I were to load everything from scratch every time, uh, it would take around 10 minutes to load a session, which is a huge time suck. So I got all the samples already loaded sitting on a separate machine. So I only open the QA sessions and they connect to all the samples. So I don't actually load a lot of samples locally into my QA sessions. There are some, but not that many. Um, so load times are quicker and save times are quicker and the file sizes are also smaller. Um, Alternatively, you could try a disabled track template as well. Um, just disable all the tracks, disable the plugins, and then it should load faster. And then in every composition, you just enable exactly what you need. What do you think is a good work ethic for a composer? I don't know. I mean, the same as everywhere. You, you do your job and you deliver on time. Um, I have found now that I've been doing this for over 10 years that boundaries are important. Otherwise, people will walk all over you and call you on a Sunday night when you're trying to watch John Williams at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, just making it very clear that uh, I'm not taking business meetings in the middle of the night or, or on weekends or, you know, after hours unless there's like a huge time difference between me and the client I'll accommodate it but um, you know uh, I try not to work myself to death anymore I try to have a little more balance and set more boundaries with clients and just be like this is how far I'm going but I'm not going further because that's going to deteriorate my health and it's not going to serve anybody if I just burn myself out and then you know what do you then do then nothing um, I guess at the beginning we're always all a little more eager to please and we're all a little more eager to prove ourselves and so you know we work unhealthy hours but I don't think the amount of hours worked have anything to do with work ethic if you're focused and you can get your shit done during bankers hours that's actually preferred because um, I've worked at studios where like A-list composers working bankers hours, taking weekends off, like it's clearly possible to do that if you're organized and, you know, focused and you do your shit on time and you don't procrastinate too much. Um, the studios where people work like their 16 hour days, 
Those are usually the studios where people are also incredibly inefficient. The studios that are incredibly unorganized, um, where everybody's just kind of always there, but there's also so much water cooler talk in the hallways and everybody's so unfocused. And yeah, naturally, because once you hit hour 10, how are you going to stay focused? Like people are just slow because they're so burnt out. Um, it's just really silly, like, and so unnecessary because I've seen the opposite happen. And so hours have nothing to do with work ethic. I know studios where people work there 16, 20 hours, seven days a week, and I would not say they have a good work ethic because they're so unfocused and so unstructured and so struggling so much to be organized and getting their shit done that like that's just terrible mismanagement. So, um, yeah. Have you ever done any dance music production in college? I guess at Artes we did some dance projects because they had like a dance department attached to the music department uh, like there's different arts departments in that school it's like a school of arts it's not just a music conservatory um but i i don't think after that i've ever done a dance music production i've done like a theater production but that wasn't really dancing i guess that was more like i guess it was like acrobatics and stuff but yeah not often Any plans for a CD release for Klaus Family 3? Um, that's not up to me. Uh, that's up to the label. And if the label manages to broker a deal with uh, a, a sub label that will release a CD. It's difficult to get that done in general because um, it costs money for the people that are making the CD release. And usually there's no profit to be made. So unless someone takes pity on <laughs> the score and is like, we want to release an actual physical CD, it's not going to happen. And I have no sway on the matter. Uh, that's usually handled through the label that publishes the score digitally. And so, yeah, I, I have no control over that. Because I have, I don't own the rights to anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I have no sway on any releases whatsoever. I do try to put digital releases into my contracts now. But at the end of the day, if a production decides that no, they don't want to release it, then that's just the reality of it, unfortunately. What types of film projects throughout your career have been the most fulfilling? Oof. I will say I do love the horror movies I've done. But I also love all the stuff where I get to record live orchestra. I don't know, different projects are fulfilling in different ways. Some are creatively fulfilling, some are fulfilling on a human level where you just get to work with your friends and you just enjoy, you know, working with your friends. Um, some of them are fulfilling because they're just more financially successful. Um, and then some are fulfilling, uh, you know, because of the live recording and the collaboration with the musicians. So. I couldn't really pick one, but if I had to pick one off the top of my head, it would be the horror movie I did, The Devil Conspiracy, and probably, I, I did love working on the Klaus Family movies a lot. I do enjoy working on the war drama right now. It's a very different score. And the VR game would, I, I think the VR game would actually be at the top of the list. It's not out yet, obviously, but... <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, that's not a film project, but yeah. What trends have you noticed in top tier film music? For example, I've seen the use of super fast cuts, flashing images and other effects that can trigger epileptic seizures. Can you name one trend? In top tier film music? Right now we love drones, I guess. Drones and experimental stuff. Um, and not so much the traditional orchestral melodic experience. It's still there in um, a lot of um, 
still there in a lot of uh, animation and kids entertainment. But yeah, currently I feel like there's more of a space for people like Ludwig and Hildur and, you know, people that are just doing avant-garde stuff a lot more. Um, so that, that seems to be the current trend. But, you know, it, it doesn't really mean that that's going to stay. It's just what's currently demanded. But, you know, if you look at the Mandalorian, you know, they d deliberately didn't score it like traditional Star Wars. They wanted something modern and new and experimental. So that seems to be the thing right now. But that doesn't mean it's going to be a thing in the future. Like these things, just like pop music and rock music and all that, these trends change every couple of years. So, you know, we'll see where this goes. Do you have any experience with trailer music? <clears throat> Not really. Um, I've scored like two trailers, maybe three. And that was for movies that I also scored. So it's where they wanted the score to also be the trailer music. And so I would rearrange the score into trailer music. Um, but other than that, no, I don't really do trailer music. That's such a specific niche, such a specialization of composers that do that sort of thing that I, I it's just not my it's not my niche it's not where my expertise lies um are the hollywood strikes affecting composers yet they're starting to affect composers but it's gonna be the biggest impact is gonna be next year i think do you prefer using only dynamics for modulation or do you use both dynamics and expression with a mod i use both because i don't personally think that three dynamics are enough because most sample libraries just have like three velocities um, and real instruments obviously have seamless velocities infinite velocities so um, I usually don't find it's enough and also some sample libraries are normalized to where the lower uh, velocities are made louder so that when you use the mod wheel it's really just a temporal change or an intensity change but not necessarily a loudness a big loudness change and so then I like to use CC11 or CC7 to actually also control the loudness of the instrument. But I usually use both because why the hell not? Not always identical, you know, depending on how the library reacts to the CCs. But I do like to um, enhance <laughs> the dynamic range that is there because I usually find it kind of limited in sample libraries. What's your opinion regarding AI? Not much yet. Um, I mean, there's not much happening yet uh, in the music front. Um, there is some music AI, but it's very, very rudimentary at the moment. Um, I think if I were a library composer, I'd probably be more concerned about that especially like the lower tier library music. I wouldn't say it's ever going to replace or anytime soon, at least the higher tier library music, like the custom trailers and, you know, that really highly produced stuff. Um, but lower tier library music is probably going to be replaced by AI potentially. Um, so that would probably be something that I would be concerned about if I was a library composer. Um, I don't think it's ever or anytime soon going to replace film or game music or TV music that is like actually done to picture or specifically designed for the game. I could imagine music editors working with it and finding temp scores um, specifically for what they need. I could also see directors maybe using it as a communication tool. Um, which, you know, I'm I'm all for anything that makes communication better. Um, but yeah, what I, I could see an AI assistant as well. Um, helping us with workflow, for sure. What else? Yeah, I'm not super concerned about AI replacing custom scores anytime soon because that's such a specific skill set. And like I said, there aren't many of us, so nobody's going to make bank by developing such a complicated AI to replace, what, 10 composers? <laughs> 
<laughs> you're not going to turn a big profit off of that. Um, maybe it's going to be helpful for students as well who don't have any budget to, you know, practice and to, you know, find placeholders for the score. I don't know. Um, I think it's mostly going to be used as stock music, basically. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm not currently super concerned about it. Also, as far as I know, at least in the US, you can't copyright AI music. And remember, the studios are keeping 50% of our rights, okay? Which means they're getting 50% of our royalties. They're getting hundreds of millions of dollars every year in royalties, if not more. I don't know how much there is, but um, they're getting a lot of money from the music because they own 50% of the rights. But if you can't copyright AI music, we're not getting royalties, but they're not getting royalties either. So I don't see studios being like, yeah, we, we don't want those hundreds of millions of dollars from the music being distributed because you can't collect royalties on something that is instantly public domain. So yeah, I, I don't see it yet, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll eat, maybe I'll eat my words. <laughs> a couple of years from now. All right, what else? Should composers consider joining a PRO like GEMA for Europe and ASCAP for the rest of the world? ASCAP and BMI don't cover mechanical rights much. Is that something composers care about? Um, I would join a PRO, yes. Um, which one doesn't really... I would pick the one wherever you have the most releases because then you get your royalties faster or the one where you live so you don't have to take care of tax exemptions. I'm with GEMA for the entire world and ASCAP for North America, but I can basically change that at any given time and designate different things. But you can pick, I mean, you can be in a lot of PROs and just designate different territories for them. Um, but yeah, I would definitely do that so that you can register your pieces and collect royalties, yes. Um, mechanical rights are really more for like album releases and that sort of thing or when music plays on, you know, streaming platforms and that sort of thing. Um, I usually have those collected through CD Baby or through the label that I'm working with. They have like... Um, a service that is collecting mechanical rights. Uh, so if you think that there's something to be collected, for me, it's the minority of stuff because most of my stuff is rights from television and streaming and theaters. Um, so I'm getting the most from that. Um, I get like a couple hundred bucks, I want to say, from like Spotify and streaming all that stuff, iTunes, Apple Music, whatever, all the music streaming platforms. Um, I mean, it's worth it, you know, but uh, yeah, I usually have that handled through a separate service for sure. All right, we already talked about AI. Um, Hi, do you mix your own orchestral music? And if so, would you consider dedicating a video to that and share your expertise? I can do that. Um, I don't mix it if I can avoid it, because I always think it's nicer to have a separate set of ears on the music. And especially if you do live recording and I have to deliver like a surround mix, um, I don't do it myself because I don't have the expertise to deliver a surround or Atmos mix. Um, Sometimes I will mix my own stuff, yes. Um, if there's no budget for a mixer or I only have to deliver in stereo, I will do that. I can, yeah, I can do a dedicated video on how I mix. Though I will always say maybe learn from an actual mix engineer and not from a composer, you know, because my knowledge is going to be watered down knowledge. It's going to be whatever is relevant to me, but it's not going to be like the expertise that a score mixer would bring. But yes, I'll put it on my list and I'll make a video about it. Um, 
does having a YouTube channel with an audience affect your employment opportunities in a similar way that actors with larger social media followings are more likely to get cast? That I don't know. I, I have heard that, that some actors are getting cast more because they have a built-in audience and studios love free marketing, obviously. Um, I do find that what my YouTube channel does is it gives people a good idea of who I am. And like I said earlier, people like to connect with other people and work with them. It's not just about music. Um, it's about people having a feeling for who you are as a person and as an artist. And I do feel like YouTube is helping with that a lot for potential higher for potential employers to get to know me a little bit better and for them to figure out who I am and what my values are and then also what my music is of course but they kind of get a better idea of the whole package and um, I think that's important and I think that has definitely landed me a couple of jobs just because people were connecting with me as a person Your videos are educational and eye-opening at times. Did you have anyone do what you are doing for us? Or did you want to do this because no one was ready to impart this knowledge? I mean, yeah, people taught me this when I was an assistant. And I mean, there are other people on YouTube doing this. Um, and there are paid teachers doing this. Um, I wanted to do this mainly because... First of all, there I f it felt like there weren't enough women in this space. I don't think there was another female film composer doing this. And I also felt like the space on YouTube was a little oversaturated with library composers, which I don't denigrate in any shape or form. Um, but the workflow for library composers is different from the workflow of um, film and game composers. And so I felt like there was some information missing. I did find that a lot of the information is on on film scoring is on Junkie XL's channel as well. Um, and like you have Austin Wintory to represent the gaming crowd very well and, you know, talk about that process. But yeah, for film um, and TV and games, I just felt like there weren't enough um, enough people talking about that workflow that I had learned under other people and I was like well that's information that should probably be out there because a lot of film schools aren't teaching this um, and I also got tired of teaching people at my studio so I figured why don't I just make videos and then I can just point them to the video and I never have to explain shit again um, but yeah um, yeah I felt like there could be more practical information on the field um, and I didn't feel like uh, a lot of composer YouTubers either came with the with any experience at all or they didn't come with the experience specifically for film. So that's why I wanted to do that. And, you know, it's good for the soul to have your own thing and to be helping people. So that's that. Um, what is the best way to practice? Oof, there's no answer to that. Um, it's whatever works for you, really. Um, I'm really bad at learning from just listening to someone, for example. I'm not a good, like, I hated that in class when there was a teacher who would just be there and talk without demonstrating stuff. I need to see things either in a video or, you know, demonstrate it in real time. Or I need to read about it and, you know like do it myself um, but I'm not really good at you know taking an abstract information I need to either do it or have it done in front of me and have someone explain it while they're doing it um, but other people are different other people learn best from podcasts uh, other people learn best in a you know academic situation other people learn better when they're teaching themselves um, I learn orchestration better when I do mock-ups than when I analyze sheet music. I can do both, but I find mock-ups to be more useful to me in absorbing the information. Um, 
I find it easier to study uh, harmony on the piano because of the layout of the piano than on the guitar, you know? So figure out how you learn best, but also figure out which aspect you learn best in what way. Because I had to very much recontextualize a lot of things I learned in school in a way that I could understand them better and absorb the information better. So that's really for everybody else to figure out for themselves, unfortunately. Could you share how composing changed your perspective, listening to music, if at all, like how your listening changed from the beginning of your journey until now? Um, I understand more when I'm listening now. Like there are just certain chord progressions and certain orchestration techniques that I can instantly figure out by just listening to it. But besides that, I still try to just enjoy music for what it is. Um, and just go by taste and whether I like it or not and not listen academically all the time. Just when I hear something really interesting or something that I just can't get out of my head or something that I find just uh, something that I'm just in love with, that's when I'll start to analyze it and be like, okay, why do I actually love this so much? Because I want to figure it out. But other than that, I really try to not listen to academically i have noticed i'm getting a little bit bored of some uh I i'm i'm getting a little bit bored of some music because i feel like i've heard it a million times before or something like that you know which i think is just something that naturally happens if you've listened to so much music and you've written so much music then um, some music just feels a little worn out at some point but still I try to just enjoy it what is your most beloved MIDI controller I don't really love any of them to be honest uh, I love the monogram CC but in, in as far as like like keyboard controllers go I don't know I don't know I like the Akai that I have but um, I don't know <laughs> You know, I'd love to design my own if I could, just to be exactly the dimensions and exactly have everything that I want. Maybe one day I'll just have a custom controller built for myself. I don't know. Is your template set up in surround? If not, is that intentional and do we really need it if we have our scoring mixers? Most composers are not set up in surround. I'm not either. Um, I know two composers that I've worked for in my entire time in LA that have been set up in surround and that's only because they've been um, they've been having mixing studios at their studio so the mixer would come in and mix at their studio but for the most part our stuff goes out to score mixers and they do the surround thing and we don't deal with it because that's a whole nother can of worms that we just don't need to deal with. When you deliver the soundtrack cues, do you have to deliver only recordings plus MIDI or also the notation? I mean, the production gets everything if we have notation. Otherwise, I'm not going to notate the score, no. If we didn't have live recording, then there's no notation of the score. Uh, very often, they won't even ask for the MIDI. They just want the live, the mixes and the stems for the most part. Did you learn to work with WISE regarding composing for video games? No, I did not. The game I'm working on actually uses the Unreal Engine. Um, I think it's called Quartz Engine inside Unreal Engine. Um, so I did not learn WISE. It's not necessary, necessary. I mean, if you're interested in it, by all means, learn it. Um, but I do communicate a lot with the game developer in what is possible with their engine and how I need to deliver things and um, they kind of explain things to me and what's possible, what's not possible, what is theoretically possible, but a lot of work on their end, all this stuff. So there's a lot of communication and I did watch a bunch of videos about their engine so I understand how it works and um, can implement that into my music. But no, I so far I have not learned any implementation software because they won't let me touch that anyway. <laughs> 
they would never they have engineers for that are you considering movie directing in your future as well no i don't think so not currently maybe a couple decades from now i don't know uh it's not something i would want to do currently i know there's some composers that are exploring that but yeah i don't know N no probably not do you stick with the exact same reverbs for everything you compose in the same genre? Are there any instruments you shouldn't use plate reverb on? And when does hall room re reverb work better? Um, yes, I stick with the same reverbs in general, um, but I might pick different presets. Um, like for vocals, I do like to use a plate reverb, but hall room reverb I use for orchestral instruments um, really depends on the composition and the genre and the style and everything and how I want to mix it but yeah um, for the most part if you're in the orchestral space you're gonna want hall or room reverbs um, and not so much plate reverbs um, but you know try it out see how it sounds sometimes Things that in theory shouldn't work do work actually in practicality. So um, trying it out is always the best option. What does your day look like? Um, I get up pretty early. Like really early. Like 4.30, 5 a.m. 5.30, some, sometime around that time is kind of my sweet spot to get up. Uh, it didn't used to be that way, but... It's like I can either get up really early or I have to sleep in, but the in-between doesn't work well for me. And I usually start composing really early as well. Like that's the first thing I do. I will make a coffee and then I will see if I got any like emails that need instant answers. But if there's nothing uh, super urgent, then I will just start writing and I will write for several hours because this is kind of the time in the morning when nobody's bothering me. <laughs> And also when nobody expects me to be awake, you know, so nobody is trying to reach me for anything. So I actually have several hours of just me doing my thing, writing, and then I also get a head start on the day. So come 9 a.m. and people start to <clears throat> people start to call me and people start like the emails start to come in and I need to manage my team and all that stuff. Um, I can be a little more relaxed because I, uh, I've already done so much composing work. And um, yeah, then I usually do some maintenance tasks. Then I have food. Um, and then in the afternoon, I do lighter tasks like mock-ups and stuff. That's usually not when I write new music anymore because um, that's kind of when that energy is used up. But that's when I can do technical tasks like mock-ups and revisions and you know doing like stem prints preparing files for orchestration all this other stuff paperwork accounting um and then usually uh around 5 p.m i stop uh, go to happy hour with friends or just chill on the couch <laughs> take a bike ride whatever just you know enjoy my evening uh, and then go to bed early because i'm getting up early like i go to bed like a grandma I'm a toddler, that's what I'm saying. Are you a morning person? Yeah, I uh, like I just explained. Um, how do you organize your day when juggling multiple projects? I do it the same way, but I will um, reserve one project per day. So I will, um, I will make sure that. I, I will try not to do different projects in one day. I struggle with that. So when I get up in the morning, I just really want to be like, today I'm working on project X and then tomorrow I'm working on the other project. Or I will block up multiple days to get a bulk of the work done, send it off to the production so they can do their reviewing process. And then the next three days or so, I'm focusing on the other project and I get that done. Um, and send off material from that so that that production then you know can review stuff and while they're doing that I jump back on the other project um, and then I'll also delegate with 
team members, obviously, additional writers and other team members that help me with this stuff so that while I'm on the other project, I still have people working on the original project so that nothing ever, you know, fully comes to a halt. But yeah, I do find it hard juggling more than two projects at the same time. When it hits three, it's really difficult to organize because at that point I'm also um, managing so much that it gets really silly. What was the process like for the Where My World Begins EP? Um, so that EP is music that was rejected except for the first track. That was for like a, a short film. Uh, the other tracks are rejected music. So there wasn't really a process other than me pitching for projects and um, putting a lot of effort into those demos. And then sometimes I use those demos on other projects, but in this case I hadn't. And these were lying around on a hard drive for a long time. So I was like, why don't I publish those? <laughs> you know, Why don't I just make an EP? And so that's a fairly simple process. You just... Um, I, I do it through CD Baby. You design a cover photo um, and then just upload the tracks. And, you know, I mastered them beforehand, obviously, and um, enter all the information and then hit distribution. And then within usually a week, CD Baby will distribute it to all digital platforms. And then you can also enable the, um, the royalty collection there, their publishing deal which I do all the time, so you can collect that as well. But it's a fairly simple process for something like that because I own all the rights to that music, so I can. it's easy for me to do with it whatever I want as opposed to score albums where I don't own all the rights and I don't own the publishing rights and, and the permissions to publish it, so then it becomes a more involved process. All right, the next one I've already answered. How would you approach orchestration with synths and other non-classical instruments? I just actually wrote a bunch of uh, demos and projects where it's non-classical instruments. Um, sort of in the same way, in that uh, I decide what's going to be in the foreground. Is it going to be a melody? If so, what instrument is going to have the melody? And also stuff like, uh, you know, is are there going to be very specific sounds, instruments? How do they fit in? And you would select the instruments in a similar way where, um, you know, with orchestration, it's about balance for the most part, balance and texture. And so you always try to write an arrangement that leaves room for all the elements to be heard, uh, similar to a mix, really. And so you would do that with all other instruments as well. I mean, that's how band arrangements are done as well. You want to leave room for everybody, and then the mix engineer carves out even more room for everybody. And so for any other instrument group, I do the same thing. I ask myself, OK, where does this instrument live, and how can that live in context with these other instruments? Um, because you don't want too much stuff sitting in the same frequency area doing the same thing because then you're not going to hear anything. So it's all about carving out room for everybody to be heard. That's really, that's really all that orchestration is in a way. And also then what combinations are going to create a nice texture and how am I then going to fit the texture into the context of the piece. What's your favorite in real life composer convention events moving down to LA and want to make the most out of it? <laughs> so I'm an introvert, as some of you may have guessed. Um, not by this event, probably, because I'm monologuing um, alone in my room. I don't go to a lot of events. Uh, I like to set up one on ones with people. Or like, you know, really small gatherings with like two or three people and just have lunch and do kind of the chill, let's have happy hour kind of thing. Or let's, you know, have a glass of wine and a nice meal. Um, 
So I'm way more into that than going to crowded events. I don't shine in a big crowd. <laughs> I'm not the attention hog. Uh, there are some people that really thrive in that environment that are just, you know, that always have like a crowd of people around them when they're talking and they just always have people hanging on their lips. And I'm just like, I don't have the energy. <laughs> I just hang out with my friends at these events and just try to stay as low profile as I can be. I just hide somewhere. Um, so I'm not the best person to ask about events. Uh, if you're coming to LA, most of the SEL events, definitely worth it. Um, those I love. I don't go to a lot of them, but I, I did usually enjoy them. They have a lot of screenings with the filmmakers and the composers and stuff like that. Um, and I do like the ASCAP events, um, but they're kind of invitation only, so that's not really a good tip. Um, I guess next year for the first time, or this year for the first time, I'm also going to attend Academy events. But yeah, I don't know. There are some film festivals people like to go to. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I usually just tag along with other people and try to enjoy my time with friends and then set up one-on-one -on -one meetings instead of going to these bigger events. I avoid them. I have to show up to a lot of the award shows, so they can be fun. They can also be chaotic, so it's like, <laughs> it's a mixed bag. All right. All right. What should a beginning composer start to learn first? That's such a vague question because it depends on what style you want to write in. Like orchestral music? I would start by learning about the instruments first, probably. Um, learning voicing and voice leading, those things. Learning basic harmonic theory, probably. Yeah, you know, some basic counterpoint maybe can be helpful. Not that it's like super important these days, but it helps to know th that stuff. And just kind of something that helped me starting out was also learning about music history and how composition evolved from the Middle Ages, like Western composition, obviously, from the Middle Ages to today. Um, and understanding how it evolved and also how the orchestra evolved and how instrumentation evolved, how the instruments themselves evolved. Um, I kind of found that helpful to kind of get an overview over where we're at and why we are here, <laughs> you know, sort of. Um, but yeah, I, I would start out just just start out with the basics and practice. Every time you learn something, apply it immediately to a composition that's kind of the only way i can learn um theoretical knowledge is not worth much to me if i haven't actually applied it and done it um, learn a new orchestration technique or a new arranging technique apply it instantly to a piece even if it's just like eight bars you know just practice it um Something I also loved, at, we did that at UCLA, which I thought was a really great exercise for learning orchestration in particular, is um, we would, like the teacher would put melodies and just chord symbols on a little piece of paper and then have like 20 different ones from like film scores, crumple them up and put them in a box and we would all blindly pick one and then he would have a second box and there would be just a composer name and a piece by that classical composer on it. Um, and so you would pick your melody, like E.T. theme from John Williams, and the melody would be on there in the chords. And then you would pick the second piece and I got like Brahms um, Third Symphony First Movement or something. And so then the task was to arrange this melody with those chords into Brahms you know, third symphony, first movement, the way it's arranged in there. Super cool exercise and super fun too. Um, and you you discover a lot of things as well. Um, so 
Highly recommend that. And mocking things up always has helped me a lot. Just taking pieces and making mock-ups. It practices mock-ups and music production, obviously. Um, but also being able to A-B the actual recording with my mock-up kind of helps to see where my shortcomings are in my programming. And then at the same time, since you have to play and shape every single line, you also learn everything about the orchestration and the writing and you know everything there is to know about the uh, composition. So personally, that helped me a lot. Some classical composers traditionally used to hand copy scores every single line and thought that was helpful to learn that way. So for me, it's the same thing, but with mock-ups, basically. I copy every line into the sequencer. Some composers have their own sound. You can tell an Elfman, Williams, etc. Um, would it bother you if your works became similarly recognized or typecast? No. Um... Not really, because at least it would mean I have my own style. <laughs> that would be nice already. Um, it is, though, one of the reasons why I have tried to get a little bit out of, you know, to not just limit myself to animation and kids entertainment, because I was worried that I would just be stuck to that. Um, so, you know, venturing out of that comfort zone has greatly helped me. I do admire composers that evolve over time where you can tell, okay, this is this composer, but in the 90s, and then this is this composer in the early 2000s, and this is this composer in the 2010s, you know? Like, I wouldn't want to do the same thing for my whole career. I do want to evolve as an artist. Um, all power to composers that don't do that, that just prefer to stick with the music that they've been writing for 40 years. Um, I think I would be bored out of my mind if I did that. Um, I would not enjoy that. <laughs> um, but also, you know, what's, where's the fun in that as an artist to always just stay in your comfort zone? That doesn't feel like something to aspire to. All right, I've already answered this one. How did you handle the constant rejections at the start of your career? Feels harder to pick up after every no. It still does. Um, yeah, you got to develop a really thick skin in this in this industry and sometimes also just pause, you know, just pause and maybe work on your own thing and just, you know, you don't have to put yourself out there every day of every week. Um, do collect your fair amount of rejections because, I mean, all you need is one yes, you know. Um, but yeah, it's difficult sometimes if if you've had a particularly bad streak of no's and a particularly bad streak of uh, rejections. It's, it's kind of difficult sometimes to pick yourself back up. In which case, I, you know, take a little break, step out of the studio and also talk to colleagues because they're going through the same thing. And if you can commiserate with a colleague, um, then, you know, it's easier to deal with, to know that you're not alone with this experience, to, to know that they're going through the same thing and it's shit for them too. And then you just have a beer together and you cry about the industry. And then, you know, you're going to feel better. <laughs> But having a support system, I think, is important. Having a support system of colleagues and friends that can kind of pick you up when you're in that rut of, Ugh, why, why is nothing working out the way I want it to work out? Um, so yes, um, foster those relationships. Foster relationships with your colleagues, with people you can talk to. Foster that support system because you're going to need it along the way because this industry is harsh. It's really harsh. <clears throat> How does one start working with library music? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't do library music. There are several YouTubers though where you can ask that question. Um, 
pretty sure Alex Pfeffer knows, Dirk Ehlert knows. Um, there's a couple composers on here that do library music a lot. So I'm sure they can know. Dave Kropf, I think. Uh, yeah, Kropf, is that his? Kopf or Kropf? I'm sorry, David. <laughs> But his channel, 52 Qs, is also really helpful. He talks a lot about library music and how to get into that. So, um, yeah, go there. Go to the actual library composers with those questions because I'm, I'm super unhelpful there. <laughs> it's not my area of expertise. Um, I wanted to ask if having a high base price for music commissions attracts high paying clients is actually true. I'm looking forward to increasing my fee. Um, I don't know. Is it true? I don't know. I don't know. Because it's kind of something that just happens naturally, you know? Like people will just naturally start offering you more money and then you use that as your next base price. And usually like you, you know, in my case, I have an agent, a manager who will, you know, always try and ask for more, obviously, because she gets commission. So the more I make, the more she makes. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it naturally kind of happens. And I, what I do find is that if I, um, if I end up agreeing to a much lower fee than I normally would because my base price has risen, then I can ask for more perks. I can ask for more ownership and all those things because there's more in a contract than just money. There's a lot of other things you can negotiate. So I will start doing that uh, or my manager will start doing that. Um, but I don't know. I've heard people say this, that if you up your prices, you will also attract higher paying clients. At the same time, it also means you might lose lower paying clients. I don't know. I don't know what the right course of action here is. Um, I feel like it's a much more natural progression of them offering more and you asking more. And, you know, it just kind of slowly starts to increase with your experience level. But there are clients for which I for who I will go down in price because I just want to collaborate with them or I'm interested in the project. And if I had a couple particularly high paying gigs in that year, I can do that anyway. So because my bills are already paid for. So, you know, there's so many there's so many variables to this that I don't know if this is like a true statement, but it might also not be a false statement. Again, super non answer here. <laughs> Uh, has your YouTube channel led directly to scoring opportunities? Yes, it has. Uh, mainly in games, but also in some film stuff. Definitely. Um, people are watching it. Even executives apparently are watching it, which is surprising to me. Um, How do you get out of a hole when you have to find a suitable catchy light motif and anything you come up with are melodies which are very similar to the existing ones? Keep trying. Keep swimming. <laughs> it's kind of the... Because eventually you'll stumble upon something. Take a break and then keep mulling it over again. Fill your head with more research and then wait and have your brain filter out the information. There's nothing much you can do really um you know some days you come up with a ton of stuff and then other days you don't uh, if it's an ongoing problem then yeah i i would probably figure out a workaround of that <laughs> but it's also really hard to come up with anything that hasn't been written already in tonal music so you know it's a problem How can a composer apply to game projects if they don't know about FMOD, uh, WISE, and other implementation tools? Just apply. You don't need to know these to 
be a composer for games. It's helpful, probably, I don't know. Um, some composers know these, but a lot of composers don't need them. Because on a lot of stuff, you won't be doing the implementation anyway. Um, it could be helpful for indie games, but also, like, nothing's keeping you from learning FMOD and WISE and implementation tools. I mean, the information is on the internet. So just learn them if that's important for applying for stuff. I have not found that it is important unless you're looking for like an in-house position where you would be doing implementation. Or if you're working on a lot of indie stuff, um, you know, where you might be taking care of the entire sound, maybe, I don't know. Are you planning on relocating back to Europe in the future? N no, probably not. Unless things really go to shit here in America. But things are kind of going to shit in Europe too. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. That would be a huge change for me. Um, it was difficult enough to come over here. So I, I don't think I will relocate back to Europe. But never say never. Who knows? Probably not to Germany though then. I would probably go to like Austria or Switzerland or... Probably a coastal region because I've gotten so used to the Southern California weather that I don't think I could deal with winter anymore. <laughs> uh, how much time do you spend trying out each month? Uh, do you go back to pieces you've composed for yourself in the past or do you start from scratch with each tune? It depends on... Um, if I have a project and I know I wrote a demo for something that was rejected and I know that theme would be perfect, then I just take that and present it to the production. Because, you know, once you've done your 100 or your 150 pitches and you've written original music, you have like a whole hard drive full of tunes, <laughs> a whole hard drive full of fully produced pieces that are waiting to be used. So um, unless I have an instant idea, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I have an exact idea for this character or this place or whatever. Um, I'll just go into that folder with like 200 pieces and just be like, I could swear I've written something that would go with this. So that's another thing I do. But yeah, if I can, I start from scratch because I like I like the writing process. Um what do you think is the most efficient method for a composer to establish a presence online other than YouTube videos? Maybe something more short form. Yeah, I mean, TikTok is a big thing and kind of a good way to be naturally discovered. Um, Instagram reels are very popular. Uh, but yeah, YouTube. See, I would say the platform itself doesn't necessarily matter what I would say is consistency matters because the algorithm publishes you if you don't, if you're inconsistent. So, and it takes a long time to build up an audience anywhere. So um, that's the one thing I would say is make sure you're consistent, whatever format you pick, be consistent with that format and pick something that works with your personality, you know? Because not everybody is, you know, good in videos, but maybe you're really good at writing blogs or writing posts or, you know, taking pictures or whatever. I don't know. Already answered that one. What would be your dream project to work on? Oof. I'd love to work on a big fantasy game or a big fantasy movie. I love fantasy, especially like high fantasy. That's kind of my thing. Or like science fiction also, fantasy and science fiction. Um, or like a really nice animated movie would be cool. But yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of open to a lot of things. Or like a really serious drama. Um, I don't know because, see, I've I've worked on some projects that I thought would be dream projects and they've turned into a nightmare. 
because the project itself is actually it's something I discovered recently. The project itself is not actually the important thing. The important thing is the people you work with and the work environment that you're in. Because you can be on your dream project if the people in charge are an absolute pain to work with and it's just a toxic work relationship. You're not going to enjoy that dream project, unfortunately. So the people are actually more important than the project itself. All right, already answered that. Already answered that. Sorry, I'm reading through all of your questions. It's so many questions. Jesus. <clears throat> um, what do you think is going to be the result of BMI selling and going to profit model? I don't know. I don't know what the, what the, I'm ASCAP, so <laughs> I don't, and I'm happily ASCAP. They've treated me really well. Um, I love the people there. I love that it's run by artists, you know, by songwriters and it's for us, by us, it's led by us. Um, they only have our interest in mind. Um, they're really, really lovely people. I love hanging out with them. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the end game is here for BMI. Um, I think ASCAP is the last PRO in America that is not for profit, where really everything, almost everything is distributed to the artists and not to, you know, shareholders. Um, I generally find it worrisome how BlackRock and Vanguard own almost everything and now including BMI. Um, you know, I, I just don't know. I just don't want those people near my royalties. <laughs> I, it's it just a feeling, you know, the same way I would rather not have those people near my food brands and everything else. And unfortunately, they own everything and they're already there. And somehow they always make everything a little bit worse. So I don't know. I appreciate ASCAP just being like, you know what, we're just not gonna, <laughs> we're not going to. Um. Oh, ASCAP is not invitation only. The events, a lot of the events are invitation only. Not all of them, though. So um, do look them up. Uh, okay. Damn, where was I? But yeah, so I don't know what BMI's plan here is. Um, I'm not privy to those conversations. Um, but I'm very happy at ASCAP. <laughs> um what do you think about avant-garde contemporary classical music? I don't have any opinions on it either way. I don't listen to it much, I will say that. Because it's usually not very, you know, easy listening experience. It's not something where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to spend my free time listening to contemporary classical music. Um, there's some that is actually really lovely. I heard some in concert. Um, but it's not something I'm currently actively seeking out. Uh, maybe I will. I don't know. I don't have strong opinions on it either way. <laughs> um, do you see yourself looking for projects or, or collaborators that would allow you to write more avant-garde type music in the coming future? Yes, I am looking for that. Um, I am working on that right now, actually. So that's also why I've been absent this whole year for the most part, because I have been doing a lot of experimental stuff and a lot of just new things, n new ventures um, that are incredibly fun. I'm really enjoying it. It's funny because the music that is probably the least enjoyable to listen to that I'm writing is, <laughs> is the most fun to write. I'm not sure people are going to enjoy just listening to it on a soundtrack album. I make some of it probably, but you know, some of it is very soundscapey and very experimental. And I'm like, it's super fun to make. I don't know how fun it is to listen to. <laughs> uh, but as long as it works with the movie and the game, it's fine. That's the job. 
Did you ever have imposter syndrome? If so, how did you overcome this? How do we define imposter syndrome is kind of the question. Because a lot of people are mistaking insecurity with imposter syndrome. Um, have I been insecure? Yes. Especially whenever I venture into new stuff. Like I can write orchestral music blindly. I can do those traditional orchestral scores like in my sleep. But the moment I venture out of that, like, you know, I have been very nervous about that. Uh, very insecure because genuinely I was lacking experience with that I was lacking I didn't know if I have what it takes I didn't know if I could wrap my head around synthesizers and experimentation and having so much freedom and all this stuff you know like if you get out of your sandbox out of your comfort zone and try to do something else you're naturally insecure um but that's not really imposter syndrome. What imposter syndrome would mean is that you have received, that would be like John Williams being insecure about his orchestral writing. When the world has already rewarded him with all the accolades and all the confirmation that he is fantastic at orchestral writing, you know, that would be imposter syndrome. That if he was insecure about that, which I doubt he is, if he was insecure about his orchestral chops, you know, when the world has already told him you are excellent at this you are one of the best at this um that would be imposter syndrome but for example john williams being insecure about his synthesizer chops would not be in imposter syndrome because i would assume he has very little experience with that and he probably would definitely not know <laughs> what he's doing in that area so that would not be imposter syndrome that would just be a realistic assessment of your skills and knowing that that's not something that you know you're good at or that you have any expertise at yet you know you can always get expertise obviously so i don't know if i've ever had imposter syndrome because i don't doubt my orchestral chops for example i don't doubt my mock-ups i don't doubt um you know i don't doubt my skills in writing traditional orchestral scores for example i n i've done that so often that i know that i can do that um but I have been insecure about a lot of things. Um, especially also if you're working with a new filmmaker and you're not nailing it right away, it's very, you know, insecurity inducing. Cause you're like, oh, am I not good at this? Am I, what if I'm, you know, the wrong person for this gig? I don't, you know, you start questioning yourself. So yeah, I don't, I think we're labeling imposter syndrome wrong a lot of the time. Um, because the things I'm insecure about are generally things that I know I don't have enough skill in. <laughs> I know myself very well. I know what I do well and I know where I have a lot of studying to do still and a lot of learning and practicing. And so if I venture into that area, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm a little nervous about that. But so far, you know, I've always come around. So I'm, I'm gaining more confidence in that area. But it's definitely something where I'm questioning myself a lot more. I'm second guessing because orchestra also has much stricter rules than anything else. And so it can be comforting to have the rules of the orchestra, you know, and to have those restrictions. And the moment you remove that and just give me absolute freedom, I'm like, oh, my God, where do I go from here? It's too much freedom. Please put me in a cage again, you know. So, yeah. It's something I'm getting used to, though. It's something I have started enjoying. It, something that was anxiety inducing before is now actually enjoyable. So it's again just a question of practice. Just do it enough, do enough research, practice enough, gain that expertise, and then you'll no longer be insecure about shit. All right. Can you give any advice to record an orchestra with a small budget for mics? Would you use close mic with some room mics or would you go for a Decca tree? Um, not sure I understand that question. If you record orchestra, you're booking a hall and that hall comes with equipment and probably a Decca tree. So you don't have to actually worry about the equipment ever. Like you're not paying, like you're paying for the hall and the hall then comes with the equipment and assistance and everything. The Decca tree usually just, just stays up anyway. So I don't 
No. I don't know if I would record orchestra in the first place. If you don't have a proper hall with a proper setup, maybe don't. Then I would probably rather say do the best mock-up you can make and then record soloists and then have the soloists layer over the mock-up to um, hide the mock-up under the live soloists. That might be a better way to go than trying something too big for too small a budget because that's probably not going to get you the results that you would like to have. <clears throat> Do you ever think about different vocations? Like doing a different job? No. I've done different jobs. It's it's not fun. <laughs> like we all have to work so many hours anyway in any job at this point. That I'd rather do something I enjoy than do something that I don't enjoy as much, you know? Like, then then what's the point? I'd rather spend my time with something. Also, I've gotten to a point now where my job is a little more flexible and a little more relaxed and I'm financially secure. So, no, I would not want to switch and start from scratch. That seems like a night. I'm too old for that shit. I know, you're never too old to change it, yada, yada, but... I'm tired. <laughs> I am tired. It's been too many years in this industry. I am tired. I'm sticking where I'm at now. <laughs> um, coming from Europe, is it possible to live in LA without receiving a sponsorship from someone who hires you? You can come as a student. Um, but other than that, you need a sponsorship. Or I guess if you have a partner that you can marry, that would be another way to come over. Um, yeah, other than that, no. Um, no, there's, I don't think, I mean, I'm not up to date with immigration because I have a green card, so I don't deal with it anymore. I'm going to become a naturalized citizen sometime soon, whenever I feel like taking care of that. Um so I don't know what the exact rules are, but yeah, you usually need some kind of sponsorship from someone to come over. Unless you come as a student or as a spouse of someone. When recording an orchestra, do you record several takes? If you do, don't you have problems with the face cancellation? Um, we do record several takes, but we don't layer takes on top of each other. Um, which would be the only way you could get face cancellation but also you don't usually get that either because the performance is not similar enough for there to be face cancellation usually um, but it usually doesn't sound as great we've tried that actually recording with a smaller orchestra and then layering that into the mock-up and then recording like layering more takes on top of it and it usually doesn't sound as good Usually layering one take into the mock-up sounds better than layering multiple live takes. I'm not really sure because you don't have that problem in um, you don't have that problem in samples because you can layer almost an infinite amount of sample libraries and it'll sound fine. But somehow with with live recordings, I have found that it doesn't sound as good. But maybe that was just me in that specific scenario. But it's usually not necessary if we're layering it into the mock-up anyway. It's big enough. Um, for live instruments, have you had any problems recording parts with rubato or tuning issues? Um, horns tend to have tuning issues, yeah. Um, in some areas, in some locations. Um, sometimes the oboe they have like a bad read or something they will always blame it on their read uh, <laughs> but I mean you could have tuning issues if I once had a tuning issue but that was in college because I wrote a piece for strings and like E flat minor which is not a key they love and it was all out of tune <laughs> um, uh, tuning issues are usually less of an issue outside of brass um, Rubato, they often need some practice tracks with that, but you still do rubato very often with the click track. The way we usually handle it is by not just keeping a, f a quarter click, but 
when we do the rubato, we put like eighth or sixteenth note clicks in between the quarter clicks so that they have more of a separation uh, in between the regular clicks so that they can hear the slowing process a little bit better. If it's like a consistent, you know, accelerando or, you know, slowing. If it's just rubato, um, I usually record that separately. But yeah, that's that kind that's kind of difficult. You have punches and streamers that you could use for that. Um to just do like free time, you know, without a click track. We have done that too. It's tricky. It requires a little bit of practice. But those are professional session musicians that have really great timing, so um, if you have the time, you can do it. I some I usually avoid it just because session time is expensive, and this unless it's really contributing to the piece, I don't do rubato that much. Or I will have the soloist record first, then make a tempo map around the solo performance, then build the orchestra around it, and then they record to the solo instrument. I've done that too. There are different ways of doing it, but it's very involved and often not worth it. So if you choose to do that, choose wisely. <laughs> How hard would it be to figure out by yourself all that you learned assisting other composers? Uh, I don't know. I haven't tried. I think there would be a lot more trial and error, I would assume, because you have to make a lot of mistakes to figure out the like right way of doing things. Whereas as a composer assistant, you learn the right way immediately. I say right way because obviously there's more than one way, but um you learn you know a good one of the good ways to do it immediately so you don't actually have to go through the painful process of uh you know of making mistakes and then having to fix the mistakes overnight and you know doing all that so it's probably faster to learn under someone else i would say um but you know you could learn that in other places as well, I guess, or just by trial and error, figure out good ways to do that. Um, it feels like it would be a harder, slower route, but you know, nothing wrong with that. With the quality of mockups today, why do composers bother with orchestras anymore, especially if they're doing hybrid scores? Um, I mean, orchestras will always sound a bit better. Um, we don't have the technology yet to make it sound 100% real. Maybe sample modeling is gonna change that one day, but they're not ready yet either. Um, but samples cannot match the expressiveness of a live orchestra um, and the richness of a live orchestra and the performance. Um, we can get somewhat close if, if you're really good at doing mock-ups, but it's still not one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there's some humanity that life instruments bring that, you know, samples just don't have. Uh, maybe one day, I don't know, maybe. But also, if you're given the budget, why wouldn't you record? Why would you want to put 100 people out of work for no reason? If the money is there and you're not getting to keep the money anyway, you might as well spend it <laughs> on a session. Um, so, yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, it's not even our choice if we record or not. It's going to be the production giving you the money or not. So, you know, and soloists are worth it anyway, always. So, um, <clears throat> already answered that one. Do Hollywood composers have cliques or are most people open and friendly? I don't know. Do they have cliques? It's such a small group of people to begin with. Like it's just like 150 people or something. So it's not like <laughs> there's a lot of... Um, there are certainly people that um, are friends and people that are not necessarily friends or that just don't hang out. So that's a thing. 
And you know, some composers are more reclusive than others. Which is fine, though. I wouldn't say they're unfriendly. They're just introverts and just don't want to hang out with strangers like me. <laughs> um, I still try to meet a lot of people and try to be open and friendly. But at the same time, I'm also very much uh, an indoor stay at home person. Uh, so I appreciate my alone time and I don't appreciate large events. So. There's a lot of composers who are introverts and who will probably come across as unfriendly when really they're just uncomfortable around other people, you know. And so they kind of try and hide and don't interact. And then extroverts usually perceive that as being unfriendly when, you know, they're not technically unfriendly. They just, you know, are anxious. <laughs> um all right uh i have a diploma of choir conductor how great is the chance to become a composer's assistant given my experience of writing music for three performances in the theater i'm not sure that counts for much because theater is not film uh on tv i don't know i mean it highly depends on on uh, your skill and writing style and location and all this other personality. Um, your writing experience is not super relevant to become a composer's assistant. I see that a lot where people, um, where, where people, how do I say this, want, want to be composer assistants but then all they send over is like their compositions and um, you know they just want to write they want to do additional music but composers assistants do everything else the reason they are there is to do all the work that isn't writing so that the composer has more time to write so first and foremost an assistant task is to take care of all the other shit that the composer doesn't want to do because they want to write the music. And then only like after a while, it could develop into a writing position or it could develop, you know, into, hey, when you're done with all of your other tasks, I might let you write a cue or two. Additional writers are usually separate positions or even outsourced. So um, it's not always the composer assistant. Very often it's not the composer assistant. So the writing part itself is in an application is not that important to begin with they would rather know like what are your pro tools chops can you can you do workflow stuff can you do cue conforming can you do mock-ups can you do um you know copyist work can you um manage a session can you you know do all the menial tasks like I also have people reaching out and are like, I could also conduct sessions for you. And I'm like, we either have a professional session conductor or I will conduct. I'm not giving away the most fun task. <laughs> if you want to do that, you got to get your own projects and then you get to do the fun stuff. The whole point of an assistant is to do the non-fun stuff. So <laughs> anyway, that's my two cents about that. Do deadlines cause you to rely on your bag of tricks? Yes. Um, sometimes you got to stick with the cliches and just do something you may have already done or, you know, that is the easy way out. It happens. Um, deadlines are important. And so you don't want to miss them. And if having to rely on the usual is what it is, then that's what it is. Uh, no shame in that. Um, if they wanted something more original, they could just move the deadline. If they're not willing to move the deadline, then they're just going to get a cliche. Simple as that. However, y what you can do is expand your bag of tricks. Uh, the more tricks you have, the more you know stuff you have in your treasure chest, the more techniques you know to pull from, the you know less obvious it's, it's, it's going to be that you're relying on that. Does age matter or what if someone needed a lot more than 10,000 hours before feeling ready? Does age matter? I don't know. 
Um, for some stuff, it matters. Uh, if you want to be an assistant and you're 50 years old, you're probably not the prime candidate for such a position. I would assume, which doesn't mean it's impossible. I'm just saying usually composers would be looking for like, you know, the, the 22 year old and not for the 55 year old. Um, <clears throat> and it would probably also not necessarily be something that you might be interested in, you know. Um, and it might be harder to connect with young filmmakers, you know, or young game developers. But also kind of depends on how young you are mentally, you know, like age is just a number technically. So if you are mentally a young person, then, you know, you might have an easy time connecting with people. Experience matters. Um, I do find that the older I get, the easier I find it to uh, deal with bullshit. <laughs> and not be such a people pleaser all the time and to draw boundaries and to be more level-headed in the face of problems you know not freaking out and just so there's something positive that comes with life experience i would say um so there's that uh f about feeling ready i would not wait for that probably just in general, not because of aging, but just in general, because nobody's ever feeling ready. I wasn't ready, but you know, you just do it anyway to become ready on the job, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, don't take on something that you definitely know you can't do, but um, at some point you just gotta, you know, learn to swim by jumping into the water. Uh, so I would not recommend um, waiting till you you feel like you're ready because that day might never come and then you kind of wasted all that time. So don't waste your time. We all have limited time on this earth. Just go, just go for it. Um, what are your four favorite chord progressions? I don't have any. Whatever works with the picture. <laughs> Um, also context matters there's no such thing for me as like a favorite chord progression um, as someone who lives in Europe and has a good paying job and a life here what other location do you recommend apart from the US or is it mandatory to become a pro composer um, my option for me personally was um, London it was London or LA, uh, but I don't know. This is something that I always find difficult to talk about because the reality is most composers are here in LA. Like, you know, almost every single one working on, you know, full-time working on film television productions. Um, there are outliers, of course, you know, um, but I don't really have a good, have good recommendations for building a career outside of this because I came here right after our test. I literally finished my studies in the, in the Netherlands. Then I spent the summer in Germany and then I flew directly over here. So I never even tried to do it anywhere else. So I'm not a hundred percent sure how one would go about that because there's less work and less, you know, a less dense industry, I would say, you know, because that's the one thing about LA. It's just a very dense industry. Like you can throw a stone and you will probably hit a composer or a musician or someone else working in film. You can go to any restaurant and probably every waiter is working in the film industry. I just went to happy hour with a friend at a local bar um, and we were having cocktails and the bartender is a composer, <laughs> you know? So everybody here kind of works in this field or is trying to break into this field. And then all the events are here. All the decision makers are here. It's just such a bundled energy. Um, so I just find it easier, you know, to have this uh, extreme wealth of people here, the wealth of um, people working in this industry which you kind of don't have anywhere else, I think. 
you know, a little bit in London, but um, I'm not sure there's another area, maybe, maybe somewhere in China or India or something. They also have big film industries. I'm not super familiar with that. Um, but I don't know of another area where it's so condensed, you know, where the entire city is basically laid out for one industry. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any good advice on that. Um, because I just have not tried anywhere else. Um, can you tell us what you're working on at present? Um, a war drama thriller uh, called The Last Front. We're in the final stages of that. Um, and I guess the other thing that's already on IMDb is um, I did additional music for Christopher Leonard's earlier this year uh, on a Christmas movie for Disney Plus called Dashing Through the Snow. Um, yeah, and then there's the other Christmas movie for Hallmark. I don't think that's been announced yet, but that's already done. And then uh, the VR game I'm working on. But that's also not been announced, so I can't talk about it. Unfortunately. Highly recommend getting into VR, though. It's so fun. They sent me a an Oculus device, or MetaQuest, I think it's called now. Um, and it's so fun. Uh, it's definitely the future of gaming. It's amazing. Unless you get motion sickness easily, then maybe it's not so fun <laughs> for you. I don't get motion sickness, so I don't have that problem. I do get it in the car, though, so don't let that be uh, discouraging you. I do get motion sickness in the car if I'm like on my phone or reading or something. I do get motion sickness, but I don't get it in VR games, so it appears to be a different thing. Um, would you say a music tech degree or a traditional composition degree would be more helpful in the long run? I have no idea. I would question whether a degree to begin with is helpful <laughs> at all in the long run. Definitely not if you have to rack up debt. Don't do it. That will always be my recommendation. Don't spend like a hundred thousand dollars on a degree that nobody cares about. Um, don't do that. Don't do it. You're just dooming your whole life. And those loans are not forgiven, not even through bankruptcy, unless the government changes something and actually forgives those loans entirely. Don't ruin your life. Um, but yeah, whether any type of degree is useful in this field kind of depends on the school, to be honest, and also your learning style. If you don't do well in an academic setting, I wouldn't do it. Then it's not for you. And that's okay. No shame. Um, so yeah. Question every degree. Question who's teaching it and ask a lot of um, alumni and maybe students who are there right now, ask, ask around a lot about any type of program. Um, yeah, before you spend money on it or spend too much time on it, you know, time and money that you could spend by just going to a big city, the next bigger city and actually working on shit, you know, and making connections. Um, do you recommend MIDI tracks or instrument tracks for your virtual orchestrations? Um, I have no opinion on that. I use MIDI tracks. Some people prefer instrument tracks. I don't. Whatever you want. <laughs> I have no strong feelings about either. Um, can you make a special about drums? Do you use compression and which do you use side chaining? Yes. Um, I could, I guess, if there's interest. Um, I use compression on drums and I do use Neutron's um, unmask feature on drums as well to not have the low drums conflict with the bass instruments or synthesizers. Uh, sure, I can put that on my list and figure out a good way of, um, you know, talking about that. <clears throat> do you have any interest in using AI music generation tools and do you know anyone in your area who is using them? Um, no and no. What I would love AI to do 
is help me out. Because <laughs> I don't want to use AI to create music because that's the fun part. Why would I take away the fun part of the job? <laughs> that, that makes no sense. It's like, I thought we were inventing AI to replace the not so fun jobs. And now they're like, what if we had AI create art? And I'm like, but art is the fun part. That's the thing you want to do. Um, but I do want AI to, uh, like I want an AI assistant. I already use ChatGPT a lot, which is technically not even AI. It's just like a language model, you know, it's not real AI. Uh, the way we imagine it but I also love like the AI tools inside isotope plugins you know kind of mix assistants you know which is also not really AI it's analyzing tools basically audio analyzing um, <clears throat> but that's kind of where I want AI to go in general to just have like an AI assistant and just tell them like processes that I need done and just have the AI do these processes overnight so I don't have to do it and I don't have to get someone else and trust someone else to do it um, that would be nice to just like step out for a bit and then have the AI just print all the stems and do all the like MIDI orchestration prep and stuff like that that would be awesome <laughs> so that's that's where I want it to go I want AI to just you know, I want AI to just uh, do all the shit I don't want to do. <laughs> um, how did you get your first internships to work for established composer? Was it in connection with your school? No, I applied. Um, I needed the school to green light it because it was in the US and you need like a social security number and all this stuff. And, you know, like the school needs to green light it as an international student. Um, but it wasn't like organized through the school. I just applied and then I got that. And then the rest I got through recommendations. Because um, someone at some studio always knows someone else at some other studio. And then they're like, hey, we have someone here. Uh, do you have a spot right now? You know. Or studios will also ask other studios, hey, we're looking for someone to do X, Y, Z. Do you know someone trustworthy that can do that? And then they can recommend you. <coughs> What's your favorite coffee and favorite beer? And thank you for the donation. Um, what's my favorite coffee? Uh, Sir Alverick's. It's like a roastery. Ro roastery? Ro roaster? Roaster? In Anaheim, just south of here. Uh, run by uh, someone I went to UCLA with, actually, and his, his wife. Um, I love that coffee like in general I would always recommend support your local businesses um, with properly sourced coffee and properly roasted fresh coffee um, if it's a chain here in LA we have or I guess in some states across the US you have Phil's coffee I really do like that I like a filtered soul <laughs> they have all these funny coffee names um, Filtered Soul is my favorite. And they have like real baristas in that chain, even though it's a chain, it's kind of a like hipster chain, you know, like uh, it's not like Starbucks as a chain, but it's more like they have actual baristas there that like handcraft your coffee and make it fresh with brewing techniques and stuff. And you can tell them exactly what flavor profile you want. And then they can also just make a custom coffee. For They're more like bartenders, really, or mixologists that just... Um, you just tell them what you like and then they will make the drink for you according to your taste, you know. So love Phil's coffee and Sir Alvarez <laughs> for homemade coffee. Um, I'm curious how much would you charge per one minute of music, typical orchestral stuff? How much would I personally charge or how much does one charge? Um kind of depends on the project and the budget I mean it's flexible and also how much of the music am I going to retain ownership of um, my current rate is somewhere around between like 1000 and 2000 per minute I think if I break it down because usually you I don't break it down per minute 
I break it down to like what's the overall workload and then what am I getting paid? How long is it going to take? How much of the rights am I keeping? What am I paying for as well? Am I paying additional writers? Am I paying other team members? Am I paying for live recording? Uh, so it's really hard to break it down for me per minute of music because um, it just kind of doesn't work that way because um, usually you just get like a package and then everything comes out of that package. But yeah, I would say around 1,000 to 2,000 per minute is currently somewhere where my rate is at, where it usually comes out at um, if I do the math. Uh, but sometimes it's also less. If it's an indie project, it's less, you know, then it's like 500 or sometimes even just like 300 or 200 per minute. Really depends on, you know, the project. I've also had projects, game projects, where it was like 5,000 per minute. Um, because it just came out to that. It was just not a lot of music and the fee was very high. So, you know, it's flexible. It's really flexible. Um, but also it depends on like your um, expertise and it depends on your location as well. Because obviously I live in LA. It's just notoriously expensive to live here. So I need a certain amount of pay because my, my rent alone is $2,500 and then healthcare and everything else. Like my monthly expenses are well above $3,000. So, you know, I need a certain amount to just live. Um, but yeah, it also depends on whether there are going to be royalties or not. If I know there's going to be a nice chunk of royalties, I might not be difficult about pay up front. Um, so there's that as well. Um, but yeah, there's so many variables. It's not, like I said earlier, it's not just about like the fee that you're getting up front. Also, is this good for um, your career? You know, is this going to be a career starter in a specific genre or a specific area? Is this someone who's going to bring better projects in the future? Like there's so many things to think about. Um, or is it just really creatively interesting? So you agree to a much lower rate because you just really want to do this project with these people. There's, there's so many considerations to make other than just money. But yes, we all have to make a living. So, <laughs> And depending on where you live, you need to at least cover your base costs, obviously. Otherwise, you're not really surviving. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of where I'm at. But also keep in mind, I've been doing this for over 10 years now. So, um, you know. At the beginning, I was not making this this money. I At the beginning, also, there were way fewer royalties. You know, now I get a somewhat nice chunk of royalties. Like, basically, all my running costs are mostly covered by royalties every year. So, you know, like, finances change over time. So it just is what it is. But if I'm getting more into gaming, for example, royalties might actually dry up a little bit. So we don't know. All right. Um, God, how many more questions are there? You guys are not stopping. I'm going to go like another half hour or so, but then I really have to have lunch and go back to work. Um, if there are changes in the reel with respect to duration, then how do you manage the tempo mapping in a project? Uh, you conform the queue. That's what we normally uh, call queue conforming. Uh, every queue has their own project, so you don't actually like um, you don't put all the queues into one session. That would be chaos. Um, you just see what changed in the actual queue. Sometimes nothing changed in particular queue, so you just adjust the start time of the queue um, and the embedded time code. But other than that, uh, you have to figure out whether something was added or not. You look at how your hit points have moved, and then you have to either add insert silence or delete time um, in order to make it work. It's also why very often a lot of film scores have so many meter changes. It's either a conform that happened or you generally need all these meter changes to just hit your hit points without having too many drastic tempo changes. But tempo changes work also, or tempo ramps sometimes are the solution. Takes a little bit of um, messing around, really. Um, 
you know, messing around with the scene and the music to figure it out. Or figure out the most musical way of adjusting something. If it's an easy audio edit, sometimes the music editors or dub mixers can also do it. So that's helpful. All right, what else? What's the most important thing to practice regularly, in your opinion, to make your composing skills better in the long run? Um, that I don't know. What I do know is just practice regularly. Because I already get really insecure. If I haven't composed anything for two weeks, I already question whether I can still do it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, it's been so long. Do I still know how to write music? And of course I do. But um, it's kind of like remember in school when you would have like these gigantic summer vacations and then you come back to school and you feel like you forgot everything from the previous year because um, it's been so long and it's really hard to get back into the groove and get back into the routine. So as long I I'm of the opinion, as long as you have routine and you do it regularly, it doesn't necessarily matter which specific composition skills you practice because any of those skills is going to get better. Um, don't take breaks that are too large because it's so hard to get back into it. All right. Um, how stable is producing with around 500 MIDI tracks with Vienna on Salma Pro? Um, stable? I mean, it depends on your computers. Like Vienna on Salma Pro is stable. It's made for that. I actually have like a thousand, over a thousand tracks in my template at this point. Um, and it's still stable. So I don't know the limitations of V Pro. I'm not sure. Has anyone ever maxed it out? Because it, it has a lot of slots and a lot of like it's it's specifically made for this. So it is stable hosting a ton of stuff. But the MIDI tracks would be hosted in your DAW. And that's kind of the important thing. Can your DAW handle it? Can your computer handle it? The hardware and the hosting software, like the, the DAW software is important. Because um, if your computer can't handle it and your DAW can't handle it, then you're screwed. No, no Vienna Ensemble is going to save you then. But Vienna Ensemble itself is very stable. You can fill it with way more than 500 instruments if you have the RAM and the hard drive space. Um, is the score of the Klaus Family 2 main theme available anywhere? I'm so interested in how you made the musical lift at 37 seconds. I have no recollection of that track. <laughs> but glad you like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know which track that is. I'll look it up later. Um, that, that was so long ago. Um, no, I don't have the score available anywhere, but I've actually been contemplating um, writing them down because I already have the scores from the recording session. So all I'd have to do is add the instruments that we didn't record to those scores. And then maybe I'll put them on buy me a coffee. That would be kind of a Christmas task for me. And I would probably start with the main themes of of all of my movies and then maybe like do other cues by request um because people also keep asking if i have those scores so they can perform them uh in concert and i don't <laughs> i don't have the patience to write them down um but this might be something i will do over christmas it's actually on my buy me a coffee list um of stuff to add over there and i just haven't had the time but so yeah uh, definitely. And then maybe with the sheet music, I might also just add the MIDI file as well that goes with the sheet music so that people can kind of also like do the mock up with the sheet music and the MIDI and, you know, kind of practice or whatever. I don't know. I want it always to be educational in some nature. So, um, what kind of sample library do you wish there was in the market and what sample library that you own currently comes near to fulfill that purpose? Any sample library pet peeves? Uh, also, thank you for the donation. Um, <clears throat> what kind of sample? I wish sample modeling um, was just a tiny bit further. 
especially with solo strings like they already sound pretty good uh, I feel like we're like a year or two out from that becoming a really good thing there's some sample developers that are already doing this really well with brass as well because I don't think I think we've kind of hit the ceiling with traditional orchestra sampling we've hit the ceiling of what the players can do not the the instrument players like the the contact and those players the engines um, our computers are way more capable now but you know it just feels like even a bigger sample set doesn't really help because we have sample libraries that have a way bigger sample set and more velocities and everything and they don't necessarily sound better because you have so many more cross fades and phasing and all that stuff that I don't I don't know <coughs> I wonder if we've just hit the ceiling with traditional sampling um you know like I do there are sample libraries that I really love I love the cinematic studio series 100% um, and I love a lot of the stuff that orchestral tools puts out I love a lot of the stuff project Sam puts out I mean I have my um, my video coming out soon uh, probably next week not this week since I'm doing this this week <clears throat> about what sample libraries I added and which ones I really love um, but I think like right now it seems like a lot of developers are focusing a lot on uh, textures and kind of going away from the traditional <clears throat> orchestral sampling because there's kind of nowhere to go right now and yeah I do think we need a new technology overall we need something like sample modeling um, to fill in the gaps of sampling, um, you know, like something to create seamless transitions and seamless, like infinite velocities and infinite dynamics, because that's always going to be the giveaway of sample libraries that you're just stuck with whatever the recording is <laughs> and how many recordings were made and how well it's scripted. And yeah, more recordings doesn't equal better sample libraries anymore. So yeah, not sure where we're going with this um, in the future, but I have a feeling that we have to dive into something entirely different and move away from all these tiny little audio snippets that we keep recording <laughs> and trying to make that work. Maybe it's going to be a combination of sampling, traditional sampling, and then combining it with sample modeling or something I don't know uh, I don't know but I feel like we've hit a ceiling with traditional sampling it's not gotten that much better over the past like five to ten years and I think we need something new someone needs to come up with something revolutionary please <laughs> that that's my two cents someone do this please someone else not me <laughs> Do you ever hire remote composers, producers, musicians that are not living in LA? Uh, remote composers, I phase that out actually um, because I don't like, I like fostering relationships with my team members um, and it's just easier to work with people that are in my time zone. I used to have people all over the world and it's stressful for me to manage a team that is spread out across like 20 different time zones. Um, it's already difficult enough if the employer is in a different time zone and then um, musicians I mean I hire orchestras in Eastern Europe and in Belgium and in uh, London and in other locations I'm planning on Vienna at some point uh, but that's usually dictated by the production anyway so that's not usually something I get to choose it's wherever they got the tax incentives or the tax shelter or um, you know whatever or whatever the budget is you know we can't always afford to go to London would love that but <laughs> them being expensive so we're going other locations other very good locations too like it's not like the quality difference is not that huge anymore as it used to be but 
you know, London is still like the creme de la creme and Los Angeles. But recording in Los Angeles is difficult to begin with. A lot of productions will not allow that because not only is it hella expensive, um, there's a musicians union here that um, uh, is not always helpful to productions. <laughs> and I am very pro-union, don't get me wrong. But um, there's been some bad blood between a lot of productions and the musicians union in Los Angeles. So anyway, let's not get into that. That's that's an old story and it's why a lot of productions go to London these days. Anyway, <clears throat> um, do you use a piano player to enter your media? A piano player? Like a like a MIDI piano? Sometimes. Um, not always, sometimes. I kind of want to get a smaller one that I can put on my desk so I don't always have to. I don't like having this big thing in front of me. Um because it's very bulky and in the way, but I do like to play on it and to compose on it. But maybe I'll get a smaller one for my desk. I just don't love clutter. Anyway, yeah. The pencil tool is also my friend. So <laughs> do not discriminate against the pencil tool. Something um, I've also been thinking about, one of my former additional writers does that. He has like this graphic design pad and like a magnetic pen and he actually draws it in with like like as if he's writing sheet music but he's writing midi instead of you know instead of tennis balls so that's another option i haven't quite figured out yet how i prefer it so i keep changing it <laughs> uh but you know there's still decades to figure that one out <laughs> for me um I'd like to ask your opinion on college. How much do you think your college education has helped you during your career? Do you think any connections you get there are more important? Depends on the college. Again, don't go into debt for this stuff or at least not heavy debt into for that stuff. Nobody cares about your degree. I have never needed my degree for anything. Unless I guess you want to be a teacher, then I do think you need a degree. Um, some connections are great like i know a lot of people that got really good um i got some really good uh i didn't i didn't go to usc i was admitted to usc but i didn't have forty five thousand dollars lying around <laughs> i'm one of the peasants that could not go and gave up the spot uh because i don't have rich parents and i am not rich myself unfortunately um but some of my friends went to USC and they got some really great connections out of it. But also it costs, I think, over $60,000 now for one year. So man, unless you have that money lying around and you get in, sure, do it. But I feel like that's money better spent elsewhere, maybe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then, uh, I mean, it's good to learn technique in college. That still helps me a lot. Um, knowing that uh you know when creativity is running low and it's the end of a project and i no longer have ideas and stuff and you know you're tired it's nice to be able to fall back onto technique but the degree like the piece of paper is not going to help you ever i don't think so <clears throat> yeah do you have a favorite recording hall? Um, you know, a lot of them sound very similar. Uh, I've said this before in one of my videos. I don't think most people can distinguish between the halls except for maybe air, which has a very specific sound because it used to be a church. Um, and it has this very specific tail, modulating tail. Um, like air has a specific sound that I don't actually prefer because it's so specific. I actually like more neutral halls, personally. I would prefer Abbey Road over air because if you have a somewhat neutral hall that is just balanced and doesn't do too much other shit, then you can mold it into whatever you want it later in the mix. Um, if the room has too strong of a character, there's not much you can do later, then it's, it just is what it is. 
yeah i do love abbey road we just the chris leonard's thing we recorded at warner brothers which also is a surprisingly good sounding hall that was my first time at warner brothers before that i only ever went to fox and sony which are also great halls i don't know they all sound good they all sound the same <laughs> some of them are a little wetter than others but <laughs> like in a recording it's not like i could tell the difference you know so uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and then there's also like uh, the, the Synchron stage and Teldex that I haven't recorded at yet, but that are on my list. So who knows? Maybe I'll like those more. But at the end of the day, honestly, if it sounds good, it sounds good. I don't really care about the hall so much. Like... As long as you have a good crew and a good hall with good musicians, it's always going to sound good. So, whatever. Um, what do you think about using drum loops? Um, I don't know. I don't use them. Or try not to use them. Because, and you know, I'm paid to write music, so I try to write music from scratch. I guess it's not forbidden to use them. I guess there are some library houses that are cracking down a little bit on loops and certain stuff like splice, I think, and stuff like that. Just because how do you copyright something if you're using a pre-recorded or pre-made thing? Um, it's kind of difficult. But if it's just for yourself, I mean, feel free to use loops. I don't really have an opinion on it one way or another I just feel like as a composer who's paid to do this I feel like it's my duty to you know create things from scratch and and not do that I guess but you know if you're in a time crunch sometimes it is what it is um <clears throat> with evolving tech every day do you always have to go from making a mock-up to orchestral session or a nicely mixed mock-up also goes with the clients depends on the mon the money it's always a money question um, and if the client is happy with the mock-ups if there's no money to record then we don't record it's very simple if there is money to record we record <laughs> um, sometimes there's like sort of enough money so we have enough money to record a little bit um, so then I'll just record all the important pieces but not necessarily all the under dialogue stuff that isn't in the foreground anyway so yeah I don't know um, if they give me money to record I will always record and it's the same for every composer um, yeah and most clients if they if there's budget they will want you to record as well like they will specifically request it and be like we're giving you X amount of money but we do expect you to have some live recording in there as well so yeah most people will still prefer recording both composers and productions um so yeah um which aspect of music production would you learn first if you're a beginner and what's the next to the last thing you learn after that i would learn first to properly program your sample libraries know your sample libraries and know your headphones or speakers you know set up your room properly or your your listening situation um, then learn to use your sample libraries properly that's like half the um, already ha half the production is knowing your tools um, then volume balancing is like another 30 percent of every mix volume balancing then eq EQ will clean up your mixes and then reverb and compression maybe um, and then anything fancy after that but I would say volume balancing and EQing is going to be the first thing you want to master in mixing and then dive into the other things what's your latest favorite TV show music Ooh, good question. I did love the music to the last season of Succession. Did love that. 
especially like the last the final pieces in the last episode really nice love those um let me get the camera down a bit there we go um yeah i think that would be that would be the one before that i i also love the queen's gambit i love that tv score i also loved lauren balfe's um his dark materials love those scores um all right any big difference between europe and the usa about the way the composer rights work um that's more of a question for a pro person i know the u.s allow buyouts a lot more than europe but there's also not much europe can do about that um is there a big difference not a big big difference um i feel like pros in europe can be a little stricter about what they will allow um but at the end of the day there's not much they can do to disallow you from doing anything it's your business especially my business is located in the u.s so i can <laughs> i can do whatever i want anyway um royalties are a little bit different in europe because theaters overseas pay and u.s theaters don't pay royalties so if you have a theatrical release just in the u.s you don't really get royalties and if you have a theatrical release in europe or really anywhere else in the world they actually um pay a large chunk of money uh so that would be one of the big differences for me financially how does the process work with your assistants regarding composing orchestrating cues do you have separate project files for each queue and everyone works on another queue at one time yes we have separate project files for each queue um that's the norm in general and uh, people are assigned cues i usually tend to write um all the big stuff and i usually tend to write themes and you know get the sound down first with the production and then um, after that, I bring on team members and I explain to them what the deal is with the music and what they're supposed to do. And then we have like this neat little Google sheet going. I have a video about that. And then that sheet will essentially, you know, uh, have the cues assigned and we'll have the spotting notes and in and out points and all the information on it. As someone who lives in Europe and has a good paying job life here, what other location? Oh, we already had that question, don't you? didn't we? Um, are you ever in need of additional music or any kind of assistant job to help you? Yes, I frequently have people writing additional music for me and also have me assist in a variety of things. Um, what kind of gaming do you do? Um, <laughs> I'm still... <laughs> I'm still playing World of Warcraft. Um, I haven't even made it to the last expansion. I'm such a casual gamer because if I get busy, I don't have time. And then especially with something like Warcraft, you forget what you were doing and where you were because it's such a huge world at this point. I just log back in after like two months and I'm like, I don't remember this place. What was I doing? Who am I? Where am I? What continent am I on? What was the mission? so um, it's a very confusing game if you don't play it regularly um, but I'm still hung up on it just because I love exploring that world and then um, in VR gaming lots of like Beat Saber and that sort of stuff I also love coaster combat like any roller coaster kind of thing on um, VR I, f I find incredibly fun um, and then I also played the Vader Immortal games on VR. And I've already downloaded uh, Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. I, I started it, but I have not played it through yet. And then I also downloaded a bunch of the other uh, Star Wars um, squadrons, I think, I downloaded. And Battlefront. Lots of Star Wars games, <laughs> apparently. Um, but yeah, I have to expand my... Um, my gaming a lot i'm actually um on my christmas list i have uh, a playstation so <laughs> that's gonna be my christmas gift to myself 
probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love open world games and I love generally fantasy and science fiction games. Um, and any games where you dance and do stuff like that. Um, is conducting a required skill in f the film music industry? No, it is not. Um, you can if you want to, if you enjoy it. Uh, but I want to say most composers choose not to do it themselves. They prefer to be in the booth. So it's not mandatory. It's more of a personal choice. When is new music coming? Um, Christmas. <laughs> probably November or December there's a bunch of music coming and then uh, January and then whenever the VR game comes out uh, sometime next year so that's coming <clears throat> is there a film or game genre you really love but you wouldn't like to score I think I'd have trouble with really hardcore horror, probably. Especially if it's like a VR horror game. I <clears throat> I don't know if I could. Because you have to kind of play the game to see how the music is implemented and make changes. I have not dared to play any horror games in VR. Because I'm a chicken, you know? I'm already a chicken when it comes to horror movies, especially when there's something supernatural, scary going on. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how much I would enjoy that. <laughs> I feel like I want to do it, but I also feel like I would probably cry a lot <laughs> and not sleep anymore. Um... In the past, you mentioned stacking cinematic studio strings with cinematic strings too. I already have quite a few string libraries. Do I really have to buy two more? Or would CSS also blend well with, for example, Berlin string Spitfire? Well, try it out. If it gives you the sound you want, then you don't need anything. Uh, like, it depends on what sound you want, first of all. Uh, but then more importantly, like if you already have a bunch, I mean, mix them up and see if you get the sound you want. If the answer is yes, then don't buy shit. And if the answer is no, then figure out what you need to fill the gap. But only buy shit if you really need it or want it. Don't just randomly buy stuff just because. I don't do that either anymore. Um, like a lot of people keep asking me, oh, why don't you review this in that library? And I'm like... I don't need it. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want to learn it. I don't want to install it. I don't want it to take up hard drive space and RAM because I really just don't need it. There's no gap in my template in that area. So, uh, you know, I turn down sample developers a lot that want to send me stuff. And I'm like, I'm not really interested in that, but I'm interested in this other thing you have. So that's where I'm at. Uh, okay, how do you feel about Cinesamble's Museo? I feel nothing much about it because I haven't tried it. Don't love subscription services though. I will say that. I feel like the only one that is uh, po potentially really worth it is East West Composer Cloud just because there's so much stuff on it. Um, I mean, as long as you can also buy the products, I guess it's fine to try out things, to subscribe. I mean, you know, if you want to know about music, you'll just subscribe for a month, try it out. And then if you don't like it, you just unsubscribe. Simple as that. Um, like I love subscriptions to, or like trial periods to try out things and see if I want to buy it. But I don't love permanent subscription where you can't buy stuff anymore or where it's just exclusive to the subscription. I'm just like, I'm over it. I'm over it with uh, with like film streaming services as well. I'm just like, stop making exclusive streaming. Just let me buy it. If I want it, I'll buy it. <laughs> I don't want to be subscribed to everything in perpetuity. Like, who has the money or the patience? Um, 
Do you think there is some kind of minimal music theory and instrument knowledge to become a composer? I mean, depends on the style of music you want to write. Um, for some of it, you don't need music theory or instrument knowledge. For some of it, you do. Like if you want to be an, or an orchestral composer, I would very much uh, uh, recommend you learn about the orchestral instruments and orchestral writing and voice leading and all that stuff. Otherwise, you're going to have a really hard time. But if you're into synthesizers, I don't know if you need music theory or anything like that. Because um, that's more about experimentation, I guess. Or songwriting, you know. Like, you can have a just rudimentary knowledge of of chords and such. If you're a really great lyricist, that's more important for songwriting. So, I don't know. Really depends on what you want to do. Um... Question number 117. Jesus Christ. I'm not going to get through all of the questions. I might skip a bunch that I may have already answered or that I just don't have any thoughts about. Um, just so we get through more stuff. <coughs> um, do you have any suggestions for landing an assistantship role? Um, I mean, just be aware there are like only a hundred spots to begin with, more or less. Um, bring all the assistant skills. Uh, you know, be in the location of the composer that you want to assist. But other than that, you know, try and get a recommendation, maybe from a former assistant or you know connect with the current assistant or whatever I don't know I don't know most of that is really recommendation based um, and then um, you know look on different Facebook forums and discord servers where sometimes opportunities are posted where you can just apply uh, but yeah Try and have all the helpful skills and maybe don't make it a main thing that you want to write music because, again, that is not the um, main job of the assistant. Certainly not at first. Um, next one. Can you explain how it works when composing with separate short and long articulations instead of everything on the same track with key switches? Well, you still compose on one track and then you just duplicate the region and just mute all the notes that you don't need on the second track. Simple as that. Um, yeah, that's how I do it at least. It's the fastest way of going about it, I think. Uh... Does it annoy you when people mention your looks or makeup in the comments? Sort of. Um, I've been wondering if I should mention that or not. Because most of it is well-intentioned. If I point out my makeup in the video and I'm really proud of it, it's fine. You know? Um, I was a little annoyed. There was this one video where I said I wasn't wearing any makeup, so deal with it. And the only reason I said that in the video was to avoid... Usually when guys see you without makeup the first time, they ask you if everything's all right. Because you look a little less colorful and, you know, they ask you if you're sick or something. And I wanted to avoid those questions. And so um, in order to avoid that, I just said, oh, by the way, I'm not wearing any makeup. Nothing's wrong. Like, I'm just... This is what I look like without it. Uh, so no need to point that out and then everybody basically like all the dudes in the comments were basically telling me whether I should or shouldn't wear makeup and I'm just like I'm not wearing makeup for you I'm wearing makeup for me if I want to and if I don't want to I'm not wearing it like we don't have to make this a debate <laughs> you know um 
in general, it doesn't bother me. If it bothers me if it's the only thing we're talking about, you know? Like, you can point out that my makeup is well done. I spend a lot of time learning that, so... Um, that's perfectly fine. It's more like if th like there are some inappropriate comments as well that I tend to just delete, you know, where I'm like, we that does that's not appropriate to say to me. I'm a stranger on the internet. Um, but when people just reduce it just to my looks, that's when I that's when I get annoyed because I'm like I'm giving you like a 45 minute video on a composition technique and then some dude just says like you're so pretty I didn't hear an, an, a single thing you said because you're so pretty Th that's disrespectful you know that's really disrespectful because I spent a lot of time learning those skills and sharing those skills and to then reduce it to oh you're so pretty with the makeup that's kind of annoying yeah but in general it's fine you know, if it's not the only thing you're saying, it's fine. You can point it out um, if you like my makeup or something. It's it's about balance, you know. I just don't like to be just reduced to that. Anyway. Um, all right, another question. What DAW do you prefer to use and why? I use Cubase. Um, I came from Pro Tools and then I went to Logic and then I went to Cubase. Uh, because of the way Cubase handles uh, handles Vienna Ensemble Pro, Logic was notoriously terrible with that and I hated it. And all my colleagues were in Cubase. Turns out in, in that research thing that we did, um, that is not quite done yet. The majority of film and game composers appears to be using Cubase as well. So it's kind of helpful to be on the same as everybody else. It helped as an assistant to know multiple ones, but my choice is Cubase. Um, I just prefer the way it does routing and all that stuff. Um, already have answered that already have answered that when you were talking about starting working on student film projects or making connections do you mean 100% free work not necessarily no uh, beginner projects doesn't necessarily mean unpaid projects some of them will be unpaid unfortunately but there are a lot of film schools that give their students budget for their master's thesis and stuff like that. And I think I've only ever done like one short film for free. All my other short films were paid to a like it wasn't a lot. It was like 500 bucks or maybe a thousand bucks. But at least they were paid in some form. So student film projects doesn't necessarily mean for free. Um, if there's budget, then the students should be learning to budget for music. But yeah, it can happen that there just is no budget and everybody's working for free. Then it's kind of a personal choice whether you can afford to do it or not. Because um, I have turned down free projects in the past when I just simply couldn't afford to do it. I really needed to spend my time working on paid stuff because uh, life is expensive, you know. It is what it is. It's a personal choice. Um, all right. Uh, when thinking about the addictive character of video games, do you think the worth you put out there is similar or less or bigger than with movies? I don't know. <laughs> so a lot of people playing video games turn the music off. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Spent so much time refining the music and then <laughs> not even listening to it. Man, we create an immersive experience. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess it's a personal choice what the audience values more or less and probably depends on the game. There are definitely games that have a more creative 
and immersive soundtrack than some movies. So it's a, I would judge that on a per project basis, really, um, rather than saying this genre is, you know, more impactful than another um, or is worth more than another because it's really more like how the audience receives it, you know. What, what a piece of art is worth to you is going to be very different from the next person. So, you know, it's really on a per project basis. Um, already answered that. What helps you stand out from the others when auditioning or demoing for a new project? Uh, that's a good one. I try, it's a learning process because when I started pitching for stuff, first of all, let me make this clear. Most of the projects I have, I did not actually pitch for. It's people that specifically sought me out and wanted me based on prior work. Um, or it's based on recommendations and all that stuff. It's rare, a much rarer occurrence that you get a project because you demoed for it. Um, and even a lot of demo situations are then them seeking you out to demo specifically. Um, there are the cattle call type of pitches. I've stopped participating in those mostly because uh, it's such a waste of time most of the time. Um, because you're throwing your hat in the ring with like 500 other people and it's just kind of stupid. Um, the return on investment is kind of not there. Um, but so at first when I started pitching for studio productions, I tried to stick as close as possible to the brief and I really wanted them to have what they were asking for and I wasn't booking anything. And then... Um, I kept asking my manager, like, what did the person do that got it, though? Like, what was different? And usually the answer was they did something really unique. Like, they still followed the brief, but they added something that just stood out from the crowd. Because if a studio sends out a pitch saying, we're looking for something like Back to the Future, they will get a lot of reels that are exactly that. But what they will gravitate to is the reel that does that, but gives a spin on it in some form with special instruments or a special arrangement or something, you know, whatever your own thing is. Um, and I started doing that and I started having a lot more success with that, just adding random stuff just to stand out. Whether that random thing even ends up in the production is a whole different question. It's just they're going to listen to like 50 reels or something. And after reel number three, everything's going to blend together, which is kind of, I think that was also the takeaway from the, remember the first Spitfire competition where David won? And everyone working in the industry was saying, we know why he won, because his stuff stood out. Everything else just kind of blends together after the fifth time you see the same thing. It just kind of all feels the same. And then it's so refreshing to hear something that is just different. Um, and so I've tried to just go wild with pitches at this point. I don't pitch a lot anymore because, again, I think a lot of them are just a waste of time and the production already knows who they want anyway. And they're just going to default back to that person. Um, but if I do pitches, I just go crazy. I'm just like, I'm just going to do the most out there thing just to stand out <laughs> so be brave when you pitch is something that I learned don't just give them what they're asking they don't know what they're asking for half the time so just give them some crazy shit um, that is vaguely in the direction that they're asking for and you will probably make it at least into the final round of the pitch every single time I got into the final round is when I did some crazy shit and they were like that's weird. Let's have her score the scene and see how she would do this with actual picture, you know. But again, like the success rate of pitching is extremely low. So you are better off actually just making genuine connections with filmmakers and composers and just kind of, 
get your way in that way because the studios are so risk averse and they will always 99% of the time they will default back to the people they already know and it's kind of a bit of a losing game pitches rarely work out so it's the minority of my work is coming from pitches all right um jesus should i should i close questions at this point just so we don't <laughs> we're at question number 134 uh plus the questions that i had at the beginning um do you get involved in the implementation process of music in games no i do not <laughs> not in this world will they let me touch their unreal engine that would be hilarious that like can you imagine me messing up the entire game <laughs> that would be that would get me fired um a lot of the time also the developers are like we just want you to focus on the music we'll take care of the rest like they have staff for that there are people who are paid to do that so it's fine again might be different with indie games where you take care of everything um what are critical differences in inter interactive music and how do you come up with it um you work closely with the audio director um and you also play the game whenever you can or, um, you know, try to get as much information from the people writing the story and the people um, designing everything. Um, you get all the artwork and, you know, synopsis and all the stuff. And we have with the VR game, we have weekly meetings every Monday morning. We get on a call and discuss what I've been working on, but also kind of discuss any new things that have come up in the game, um, any progress overall. I can ask any questions that I have. So um, they're taking a lot of time meeting with me every week to brief me on stuff. Uh, and we talk a lot about layers and how we want the music to interact with the different levels, the different games. What's the sound of this area? What do we want the music to do interactively? And then you also you play the game and you see what's missing, like you can feel what's missing, you know? Or you just have ideas while playing the alpha version. You're like, oh, actually, it would be really cool if this sound right here interacted with this thing. You know, you, you just try it out um, and see what feels right. And then also you see what's technically, technologically possible on the schedule, because obviously they have finite human resources. Um, and so sometimes I come up with really complicated stuff that I want to do, and then they're like, we could do that, but how much would it improve the game versus how much extra work would that be for us? You know, so you also weigh that a little bit because, you know, every idea that I have is going to cause extra labor for someone over there. <laughs> um, can you name the main stages working on a game as a composer? So if you're scoring the whole game, you have the initial briefing and research, uh, the, the onboarding process is what they call it. Um, kind of like they're onboarding a um, an employee in a way where it's just a lot of talking a lot of technicalities a lot of you know, asking questions and you know just a lot of uh, you know figuring out where we're going to go with this so there's actually not a lot of composing at first there's just mainly conversations um, and then um there's like a phase where we have like the theme finding phase for different areas of the game or characters or situations, you know, um, like the audio director usually already has like documents lined out exactly what they need for what, um, which might change along the way. But so you have the theme finding phase and then you have the theme refining phase where you expand on the ideas and make changes as requested by the client. Um, there's also a phase where you work on cinematics and cutscenes and all that stuff because um, most narrative games have that sort of thing and then um, usually around that point you will also start having an alpha build of the game you play through it with the people and discuss things and just kind of see what needs to change what needs to improve what needs to be exported differently and then you kind of get into the next phase where you refine everything that's already there, add anything that is missing, and then they usually build the beta of the game and you play through that and then 
hopefully that's what it is. Um, if not, you just go back into it and just go, oh, there's a couple more things I'd like to do here and change. Um, you know, and there's a lot, there's a long testing phase of the game as well, where everybody plays it a bunch of times and tries to break it and tries to fi find bugs and, you know, all that stuff. So, but those are the main stages. And then um, you can make a soundtrack album if the game studio wants you to do that. Um, but that's kind of after the game is done. Um, okay. Yeah, how come producers, film directors, music supervisors don't know any music theory vocabulary at all, even vets working decades in the industry? I mean, that's not really necessary. Why would they have music theory vocabulary? I mean, they can't know everything about every department. That's my expertise. That's why I'm being hired. So I bring that expertise. I guess the thing that I'm most surprised about is that music executives are, for the most part, not trained musicians. Like, they're literally the executives in charge of music and they don't have the vocabulary very often. That's surprising to me because in games, the people supervising the music are music professionals or at least audio professionals. So you're collaborating with people that can actually speak in music terms to you. Whereas when you work with film executives, music executives at film studios, they can't do that. And that is surprising to me because how hard would it be to hire music executives that have a music background and can actually communicate a little bit better? I guess it comes back down to the whole like managers running the show in film, you know, managers for management's sake. And I don't know. I don't know if that's the wisest thing they can do. Maybe they're going to change it in the future. Um, I don't think it's super wise to do it that way because technically the music executives are supposed to be the, the middleman, right? Between, um, between the producers and the studio and director and the composers. Sometimes music editors can be a nice bridge between. But yeah, I don't I don't know why it works that way. In games it's a lot it makes a lot more sense that you're putting an audio pro professional in charge of audio. <laughs> right? That's more logical. But maybe that's also why they're so much more willing to take risks because um they know exactly how to guide you and how to brief you and how to, you know, gently push you in the right direction. And they can hear your skills, you know. They don't just randomly hear a piece of music. They can hear the skill that went into it and they can they know that skill transfers to other things. So, yeah, I think that's just one of the problems currently with um, the film studios that just too many people are in charge that don't necessarily know exactly what their department is doing. <laughs> it would be like putting me in charge of visual effects. Like, you wouldn't do that. Why would you do that? Of course you wouldn't do that. Anyway. Uh, all right. Do you have Dutch roots? Because I see some Dutch collaborators in your portfolio. No, I do not have Dutch roots, but I studied in the Netherlands for four years. And I also worked a lot with uh, Belgians, specifically the, the um, Flemish part of Belgium. So uh, that's where that comes from. What's your opinion on StaffPad? I have no opinions on StaffPad. I have not used it. Um, can we get connected to sync agents from any part of the world? I guess. I don't know. I haven't tried. Um, when starting a new project, what's your process for getting the inspiration suitable for it? Um, research. You do a lot of research, whatever that means to you. Reading books, watching movies, listening to music going out into nature, looking at art, um, whatever that means to you, just do research that you think is suitable for the project, fill your head with it. And then there's something that Richard Bellis calls percolation, which is technically the process of water filtering through different types of stone and then cleaning 
itself up. Um, and then at the at the end, you have clean water coming out. Uh, so percolation in this case, we would refer to as your brain is going to filter all the useful information from the research. Um, and that's where I get my inspiration from. And then just dumb trying things out <laughs> as well. If there's time, I like I like to just go wild and just try it, try shit. Maybe buy a bunch of physical instruments that I can mess around with and have fun with. I don't know. Is this Yamaha recorder behind you a synth? No, it's just a recorder. Um, I should probably get a breath controller, huh? Eventually, since I'm a woodwind player, that would be kind of. Um, Do you think that we need some new physical media, something completely new? CDs and vinyl are cool and all that, and digital has shown its flaws lately. Uh, I don't know. I don't miss the time of having physical stuff, to be honest, because you need space for it. And then if you move, as someone who moved continents and had to leave all of that physical stuff behind, I'm not attached to it. I, I don't love having too much stuff. Um... I do think there should be some kind of safety system for digital copies because, yeah, digital has shown its flaws lately where studios can just remove shit and take it away. Even if you bought something on iTunes or Amazon, uh, bought a digital copy, they can take it away from you. I make it a habit to download all of my uh, iTunes purchases. You can download all of them, even the movies and just store them somewhere else because I want to be sure that even if they remove the thing, I still have it. I still have a copy of it. So do that. <laughs> if you buy something on Apple Music or iTunes or whatever, download the copy and store it somewhere. Um, all right, I've already talked about that. Have you thought about composing concert music? <sighs> Maybe one day, I don't know. Not into it currently. Um, not super interested in it. Uh, workflow, we've already talked about that. Do European producers, musicians, directors find Americans difficult to work with or just different in which ways? Good question. I don't know considering I'm like half American now, but mostly European. Because also it kind of depends on where in Europe, because the different European countries are very different as well. Because I mean, I'm German, which is a very kind of specific European. Um, you know, I just insulted a waitress in Austria by asking for German beer and she just looked at me in shock like I had like killed her child or something <laughs> I was like, do, do you have a German beer and she was like no like any German no you can have Austrian beer and I was like okay okay I'll take the Austrian beer I just wanted a taste of home I'm sorry before I go back to America um so clearly, <laughs> we don't necessarily get along <laughs> over in Europe <laughs> with each other either. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I've also started actually pretending to be American in Europe because I have an accent now when I speak German. And people point it out and then I just pretend I'm American because then they're really impressed how good my German is. But if I tell them I'm German, they think, wow, her German is really shitty for being a German. So I feel like I can get away with more shit when I pretend I'm American. I think it's because people assume I'm stupid or something. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> like a lot of Europeans think Americans are stupid um, somehow. Um, and make fun, like the Brits like to make fun of, you know, the way that they pronounce, um, you know, terms in just a very American accent. But I don't know. 
I don't know. I have fun with it. Sometimes pretending I'm one thing, sometimes pretending I'm another. Also, I was just working on a Belgian or Dutch production and they didn't know that I'm fluent in Dutch. And so I could understand all of their conversations. And I kept that a secret for a while. <laughs> just having fun. <laughs> And then just revealed it much later at a session when I started pl started talking in Dutch to the musicians, <laughs> stressing everybody out because now everybody was like, oh, God, did we say anything in front of her that she wasn't supposed to hear? But anyway, I don't know. I just have fun with it since I have such a split identity anyway now. Um, so I think... See, I th I see, I'm seeing in the comments, I don't think Americans are stupid. I just think they've been exposed to a lot less, um, I don't want to say less culture, but less different culture because this country is so big and Europeans have a habit of underestimating how big America is and that the 50 states are really more like 50 countries and that just magically all speak the same language. Um, that's really more like it, you know? Um, like there are entire countries in Europe that are more similar than some states in the US. And I think, you know, even when I talk about LA, people underestimate just how big the city is. Like the people just in the city, there's more people here than in some European countries combined. So um, I think Europeans, if they haven't been to America, they underestimate the sheer size of this continent. And then, yeah, you can travel up to Canada. Canada is not that different, though, from the US. A little bit different. But, you know, when I was in Montreal, it wasn't like day and night different. Or you could go down to like Mexico or South America, sure, to get, you know, a little bit more of that culture. Um, but that's, it's so easy to be exposed to more culture in, um, in Europe because you drive for two hours in your car and you're in the next country. You don't have that here. If I drive two hours in my car, I barely make it out of LA. <laughs> and then I end up in a desert. <laughs> and then I have to drive for seven hours through the desert to make it to the next town. Like, you know? It's just so different. Just the dimensions of it are so different. Um, and so it's very easy to say, oh, you know, Americans are ignorant. Well, they have to learn so much about just their own country and get around their own country so much that I don't really blame them any. Like I was, I had the same opinion when I came here. I was like, how do they know so little about Europe? And I'm like, I get it now. Europe is far away. You don't just hop on a plane and visit Austria. Like, <laughs> most people don't have the money to even go anywhere. And then also, you don't have to go anywhere because you have everything here. You have all the beaches, you have um, the snow, you have mountains, you have desert, you have everything. Like, you know, you don't have to go anywhere. You can just stay within this country and, and get your fill of everything you want. So, yeah, uh, you know, also we have this opinion in Europe that Americans don't have food culture, which is also not true. Americans have a very strong food culture. It's just very fusion of everything. Um, but like, try and find a barbecue in Europe the way Americans, they take their barbecue seriously. Like they will smoke their meat for 48 hours in the smoker before they serve it to you okay the meat will like fall apart and just be yeah their beer is shit but their barbecue <laughs> you know like there's some things that they do really well and some things that they don't do so well i don't know why they keep messing with bread as a German, I don't approve of American bread. I don't know why that's so hard to do. And also the chocolate is atrocious. But then so much other stuff here. Um, so good. And just the international um, flavors that they have. Like Mexican food. You can't get Mexican food like in Southern California. You can't get that in Europe. It's just, it's not the same, you know. So, yeah. It's, I've, I've become much more open-minded 
you have to live here for a while. Like this is turning into a completely different talk now <laughs> about cultures. But I've become a lot more open minded. The longer I live here, the more I understand why things are the way they are. And I can see how a lot of Americans are very misrepresented overseas in the media because they would like you to believe Americans are one way when really Americans are a million different ways because it's over 300 million people. They're not the same. They're not all the same. It's not one thing, you know? So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from this. Um, I, I will say one last word. I find that in, in the arts and in music um, and in film, people tend to be more internationally accepting of each other, um, especially musicians. So uh, I don't find there to be a lot of culture clashes or anything. It's, it's really a lot more. We're just here to make music together and we're leaving everything else at the door. So that's kind of nice. Um, okay. My God, we're coming up on four hours. We're going to have to cut it short at some point. Um, all right. Uh, already answered that. Already answered that. Already answered that. All right, we have a lot of duplicate questions now. Um, do you feel a need to make music for yourself? A need that working on music for media does not satisfy? Huh. I mean, I do like to get paid, I will say that. <laughs> I like to get paid for my art. <laughs> Um, um, I don't make a lot of music for myself. I do play instruments just for my, like by sitting on the couch, just like playing random shit to myself, just for the fun of it. Like I'm really rediscovering the play element. I don't necessarily write music just for myself, mainly because I have so much music to write for work that I get to do most of the things I want to do anyway eventually but also like if I have downtime I really want to not write music and just kind of save that for the job for, for the work hours because <laughs> um, I, I do really need a break from it every now and then otherwise ugh, it's just you know it's like an energy that gets used up and that needs to recharge so I don't actually write a lot of music for myself I just make music for myself I guess to entertain myself <laughs> with my shitty playing. <laughs> um, all right. Are you looking at getting into education more? No, I'm not. Um, I am thinking about like over Christmas recording a couple of pre-recorded courses maybe or like individual classes. I don't know yet. I'm also thinking maybe on buy me a coffee I could offer like just like four private lessons per month or two private lessons per month for cheap um i don't know like i want to i want to keep it up but i don't want to get more into it um because i do prefer writing music um and i have enough to do in that area um yeah I was trying to get a little more into it and I just can't keep up a consistent schedule with education because I get busy with composition and then it's like, uh, you know, I, it, then it feels like I'm failing in the education space. So I'm not looking to get too much more into it. I am looking to keep up what I'm doing though. So that's where we're at. Um, how do you deal with software updates um, during projects? Oh, other than never updating during projects, how do you deal with software updates? I have older sessions with broken links and some that I can't open because of updates. Yeah, that happens. I have sessions as well that I can't open anymore. Um, I do keep my old like VE Pro projects and my old Cubase templates and old versions of libraries and stuff but eventually there comes a point where you just where you would have to transfer all the data over into your new template and kind of rework it a little bit that happens um, I try not to have that happen on stuff that is too recent but 
If we were to go back like five years from now, yeah, I don't think those sessions would just open just like that at this point, which is fine. I mean, when do I need to open that? Unless someone makes like another sequel to something or a spin-off series, then I'd have to figure that out. But for now, that's not important to me. Like what's done is done. <laughs> How do you deal with directors who are hostile? I don't. I don't. They can find themselves another composer. <laughs> Um, I mean, unless you're paying me like a million bucks to put up with it, sure. But um, no, other than that, you don't get to be hostile. See, that's one of my boundaries. You treat me with respect. And if you can't do that, we're not collaborating. Simple as that. I used to not have these boundaries and put up with a lot of crap. And, you know, we're now at a at, at a point where I don't put up with that anymore. There's plenty of other composers who will be happy about the work, so. Can you tell us some more on the last front? Not really. <laughs> Since NDA and stuff. Um, it's not out yet. It's coming early next year from what I know, so the wait is not going to be too much longer, and then I can talk about it. Um, Would you say the future of film music composers is more and more determined by streaming services? Mm. I don't know. Streaming services are not uh, sustainable for anyone currently. Not for the studios. I don't know how they thought they were going to turn like a massive profit on that. Years ago when everybody got into it, everybody was saying like, do they know something we don't know? Because this doesn't seem profitable. And now they're like, oh, it's not profitable. And I'm like, no shit. We thought you guys had some secret business plan, but apparently not. Um, but so the strikes are a result of that as well, because people, on, especially on streaming, are not getting paid enough. Um, the you know anyone really the the actors are usually well compensated, but like name actors um, and maybe name directors or something, but everyone else is not really compensated properly. And then royalties are a bit lower. Like they're still oh just okay, but definitely lower than regular TV or theaters. Um, yeah. And then also, it's not really a career starter for some reason. Like I know so many people, I mean myself included, that have done so much stuff for streaming services or that have indie stuff on streaming services, but there's so much stuff now that it gets drowned out. You know, like you may even have like a streaming hit and it's like number one for a couple of weeks and then it just vanishes and everybody forgets about it because the algorithm now favors something else and the new thing is now the thing and everybody like a month later, everybody's already forgotten that you did that thing. Um, it just kind of it's out of sight, out of mind very much with streaming services. So I'm not even sure that it's doing as much for your career as a regular TV show or a movie or, you know, a, th a theatrical release or anything like that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. They have to figure out streaming because it's not working right now as intended and nobody's making bank off of it either. So um, definitely not a great business model right now. They need to figure out something. I mean, that's above my pay grade so um they're collecting their ceos are collecting their like 20 million bucks so they can sit down and figure that shit out <laughs> that's that's not me um i've heard somewhere that the amount of times that directors producers come to visit composer studios have decreased significantly since the pandemic is this true or is it just does it just not happen anymore? Uh, it still happens, but yeah, I would say it happens less. Um, I think maybe it's also because um, it's a younger crowd now and everybody has their online means of having review sessions. Um, so, 
you know, we have like really good online systems. A lot of um, studios like stuff like Frame.io, where it's just really easy to review works by other people. Because um, meetings take time. Uh, In-person meetings take a lot of time out of your day, especially if you're like in L.A. and you have to travel to the other side of town in traffic. Like that's two hours taken out of your day right there. So it's sometimes just much easier to review stuff online and then just get together when you really do the final review or when you do the initial briefing, we get together often. But during the process, we've cut that down a little bit more because with the pandemic came a lot of good software that enabled us to do this remotely. So um, we've just cut down a little bit on in-person meetings. We haven't eliminated them by any means, but we've cut down on them just because they're so time consuming. I mean, how often have you been in a meeting at any company and you were like, this could have been an email? <laughs> this could have been an email. We didn't have to like sit here for two hours together and discuss this. So, you know. All right. Is it possible to negotiate permanent ownership of your music when signing a composer contract? Yes. They might say no, um, but it's possible to negotiate that. I own the music on a couple of my scores. <clears throat> Usually when the pay is low, um, you can negotiate ownership of your music to A, collect more on the back end um, to make up for the low upfront fee, but also to be able to monetize the music further and just keep it to yourself or publish it, you know, and make money that way. Um, yeah, it's possible. Not common with studios, but definitely possible. More possible on indie productions, for sure. All right. Um, and more coffee. Jesus. Question number 163. Poor Edwin, he probably thought like he's helping me with the with the questions. He probably thought it would be like a one hour chat and it's like it's fine. He's being paid by the hour. <laughs> um sorry Edwin, I'm using up your whole day here, like sorry. <laughs> um All right. In your video on reverbs, you don't talk about Vienna Mir Pro. Why didn't you choose it? Um, no reason. I don't have it. Um, probably don't need it. I don't, I don't know. I, I've never tried it. I don't think I know anyone who uses it. Because with stuff like reverbs and mixed plugins, I usually go with the recommendations of um, score mixers. And they're really, currently, they're really into Liquid Sonics. And that's also how I, you know, found, ab uh, found out about Valhalla, um, you know, Lexicon. All the stuff I'm using is basically what score mixers have recommended. So that's where I'm getting my information from for mixed plugins, essentially. Um, I don't know if they use um, the Vienna stuff. Maybe that's more of a composer thing. I don't know. Do you use uh, A440 tuning or do you have some other favorite tuning? No, we use 440 usually. Um, there have been times when I had to change it because we were recording in Europe and then um, some European orchestras are tuned differently. And normally they tune to 440 as well um, when we're recording film scores, especially American film scores. But we had to change it a bunch of times because we had some tuned percussion in it and the percussion and the celeste were tuned to something else, 442 or something, I don't know. And so we had to have the orchestra tuned to the tuned percussion. Otherwise, you know, we can't tune the pitch percussion, obviously. So, uh Certainly not on the fly. So that's why we had to do that. Uh, 
Would you recommend German-speaking composers to study composition in Vienna or Germany? Do you see your conservatory education as a cornerstone of your musical career? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I keep mulling it over in my head and I'm like, I, just, I don't know. I wouldn't say it was a cornerstone of my musical career. It was helpful. It had its place, but I don't know if it was a cornerstone. I like that I didn't really have to pay for it because it's Europe. <laughs> if you can, if you're American and you can go to Europe to study, a lot of the time it's going to be free for you as well. So, <laughs> if you can, if you can move over there, um, and study there for free, I would recommend doing that, because American colleges tuition fees are just wild it's out of control um no oh, that's an interesting one do you find it useful to have different amounts of reverb and type of length between long and short patches i don't but some composers do mm, i don't do it myself I do choose uh, to put a different amount of reverb on it, but I don't choose a different reverb for different articulations or instruments. Are you programming your own electronic non-orchestral patches or do you outsource that part? Um, uh, both. I uh, usually try my hand at it myself, but if I feel like I need more, then I will definitely hire a synth designer to start, you know, doing their thing. Um. <laughs> All right. Already answered that. Ah, this is also an interesting one. Um, when dealing with film score production, is it more important to be skilled in producing a MIDI mockup or to produce notation sheet music of the composition? Or is the notation assigned to a copyist? The notation is assigned to an orchestrator. The copyist is just making the individual parts from the score. Um, and then the librarian is doing the printing and taping and all that stuff making the books for the musicians. Mm, Mock-ups, 100%. Uh, half the time you don't even need the sheet music. Uh, no director cares about the sheet music because they can't read it anyway, so what's the point? Uh, they want to hear your mock-up, so that's the important part. The sheet music only comes in when you do live recording and then that is outsourced usually to orchestrators and copyists. You don't necessarily deal with that yourself. So there's usually no time to do that. Where do you copyright your music when it's independent, like your rejected music you told about, and that copyright is worldwide? So under copyright law, you own the copyright to your music the moment you create it, no matter what. You own it. Um, and then you just, if you want to collect royalties on it then you register it with a pro of your choice um but yeah the copyright is worldwide and you own it by default whether you put it into a pro or not the pro is just there to collect money on behalf of you and your rights um but the copyright is yours no matter what the moment you make it um Given you're in the US, has the move limited your ability to do work on EU, UK or European film and TV companies? No, actually, uh, it hasn't. Um, because I still have an EU passport and that comes in handy actually on a lot of EU productions that get financing. Um, so yeah, and, and um, you know, having experience in Hollywood is kind of a popular thing in Europe. Um, it's less of a less of a selling point here when you are here but um, 
in Europe, people tend to be a little more impressed by you being like, you know, a Hollywood composer. So it actually helps, I think, personally. But yeah, in-person networking is a lot harder, for sure. If you were to start making music from the start again, would you choose Cubase as your door or something else? Yeah, I would choose Cubase. I would probably skip over Logic. I would still have to learn Pro Tools because we need it so often um, for other processes. Um, I mean, Logic came in handy to, you know, when I was assisting different composers because some of them were on Logic and some were on Cubase and some were on Pro Tools. So the more DAWs you know, the more useful you are to all these people. Um, but yeah, I would start with Cubase right away, probably, instead of starting with the other ones. But that's personal choice. All right, I've answered that. Hey, hey, hey. Already answered that. Hmm. <laughs> Any culture shocks as a German in the USA? My God, the beer is bad. Like, what are these people thinking? The, uh, the beer and the bread. <laughs> Just like the most essential things to a German. The beer and the bread. Why is it bad? And the chocolate. Um, but no, a culture shock. See, the, the thing is that, first of all, even for the US, LA is kind of a special city. It's a bit wild and just so huge. Um, then there's obviously the climate that is very different. I mean, it's a desert, so very different things here. Um, the mentality of people is different. Uh, it's a lot more, I want to say, Mediterranean here. Um, you know, people are a little more laid back and, and you know, but I just think it's underestimated how different everything is, even though it's, you know, also a Western country, technically. It's just so different. Everything is different. I had to get my driver's license again here and the rules for driving are different. Also, how do these people drive? My God, the, <laughs> the aggression. <laughs> um, and then everybody drives these huge cars as well. Anyway, it's it's an adventure. They're very adventurous people. I will say that. Um, but, you know, earthquakes, the weather events, like everything is just so massive and larger than life, you know. Um, so that's one thing. And then, um, sure, there are cultural things that still need to be figured out, like, you know, healthcare. The healthcare system is not great. The prison system is not great. Um, education system you know there's living here is a lot harder I think than in Europe like life just survival pure survival here is harder um, and I think for a long time that was a bit romanticized because um, yes Americans are really good at surviving and you know doing what it takes and you know they still have that mentality but I was a little shocked with just what people here were willing to put up with because life in Europe is a lot more cushioned than life in the US. Like here they will literally let you die on the street <laughs> uh, if, if you can't pay your bills. It's wild. Uh, and, you know, it's changing, but change in a country this huge just takes a long time. So it's, you know, things have already changed a lot in the time that I've been here. So they're not oblivious to it or anything. They know what needs to change. It's just really hard to get everybody on the same page because more than 300 million people need to get on the same page. So, you know, hard to do, difficult. And also the life experience of in the different states is very different to different people. Something that would be really great for people in California might be absolutely terrible for people in Idaho, you know, because their life is just so different. Um, so you can't really make generalized changes to the whole country easily because something that is good for one group will be absolutely devastating for another group. Um, anyway, 
Um, I think, you know, the thing here to keep in mind is that everything is different. The only thing you will recognize from Europe is like McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks and like Subway and maybe Kentucky Fried Chicken. There are no stores here that you would recognize from from Europe, like just general supermarkets. You have to learn everything from scratch, everything, not just like how to read traffic signs. Everything is in miles instead of kilometers and in inches and in temperatures are in Fahrenheit, not in Celsius. You know, you have to do it's like relearning everything. Every single thing that you took for granted, stuff that you just grew up with and that you just knew intuitively is no longer useful. It's not useful here to know how much one kilometer is. And then your car obviously has like miles per hour in it, not kilometers per hour. So your sense of speed is also while driving is just different because you're reading it and you're like, the number does not go with the speed because you're still reading it in kilometers per hour. It's just all these little things that you took for granted and now you're like, I don't know how to read anything. I don't know how to measure anything. I don't know how to drive. I don't know any of the rules. I don't know how to do my taxes. I don't know how the healthcare system works. I don't know how the um, education system works. I don't understand any of this. Um, and you have to physically go into every single store to figure out what what is like you don't know what Ralph's is until you go in and then you go into a Vons, which is also a supermarket chain and you try to figure out what the difference is between Ralph's and Vons. and then you go into Whole Foods which is also a supermarket and you are trying to figure out that like what's the difference here and then you go into you know, you have to go into every supermarket chain to figure out what the difference is. What do they offer? Pharmacies. What's the difference between CVS and Rite Aid and uh, Walgreens? You know, what do they sell? Where do you get the best price? What's the actual difference between any of these? Um, it's wild. You have to relearn every single thing. Um, and I think that part is underestimated. Just just really basic stuff and that I think is the biggest culture shock because any type of routine that you may have had in your life is gone it's like you're a child again you're you're five years old again and you have to actually just relearn all these all this basic stuff but it also I feel like opened up my mind a lot because you really have to be open to it you have to let go of what you knew and embrace all the new stuff and just and just roll with it and just not get hung up on it, you know? And I think it changed a lot in the way that I think and it broadened my horizon and the way I see the world in general. Just having to do that, having to change your whole world, you know? And, and just rethinking everything and trying to get different perspectives on stuff. It's, it's very, it's very um, interesting, I think. It's something I would recommend for everyone to do if you can do it. It must be the same for Americans in Europe. Because uh, you don't have that when you travel between European countries. There are differences, especially languages. Um, but it's not like a fundamental difference like that. Like they still have enough in common that you can get around easily between countries in Europe. Um, but not here. <laughs> you come out of the airplane and you're like, what just hit me? Um and then you weirdly get used to it and it's kind of a nice feeling like half a year to a year in when you finally realize that you can read things again and you understand you understand what 90 degrees Fahrenheit are and you understand what 60 degrees Fahrenheit are you know what it feels like and so you have a point of reference and you kind of know what your navigation system means when it says in a quarter mile exit the freeway it means now if you think about it, you missed it. Um, but you kind of, you know, get used to certain things and you're like, OK, I, I get it now. I understand now. You get used to spicy food. Everything here is spicy when you come here for the first time. I know they say we don't cook with flavor in Europe. That's not true. We do cook with flavor. We just don't cook with spice. 
like we just do like the salt and pepper thing and like garlic maybe um and then some herbs coming here everything was spicy even the most regular stuff i was like oh my god my mouth is burnt now i don't even feel it anymore and then when someone visits me from europe they're like everything is spicy and you know it's like they love their chilies man <laughs> but i love them too now i've discovered hot sauce we don't do a lot of hot sauce in europe but man do we love hot sauce here but you have to get used to the new flavors and you know you have to get used to just everything and and you do you do if you keep an open mind you do and then the shock is not as big now i'm shocked when i go to europe and i see euros and i'm like it looks like monopoly money what is this i forget that they're like one euro and two euro coins I th are they even five euro coins i don't remember i'm very confused by the money now in europe because <laughs> you know it's just like weird shit that you get used to here and then over there you're like wait how did this work so yeah anyway yeah if you have the chance to ever live in a foreign country or even on a foreign continent for a while i highly recommend doing that it changes the way your brain works anyway all right If you are moving towards games music, would you attend the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco next March? I don't know. It's close enough, but it's hella expensive. I don't know. I don't know. I guess if I had a game there that is presenting, I would potentially go. Um, but like I said, I'm an introvert. I don't necessarily do super well in like crowded places. <laughs> um, All right, what else? Are directors open to work with composers who don't actually watch films that much? I mean, then my question would be, why do you even want to work on films if you don't watch films? Because I feel like you have to love it to do it because it's such a pain in the ass to do it. That if you don't love movies, it's probably not a good idea to venture into this to begin with. Then probably stick with like concert music or something. Um, but also the way you connect with directors. And I had a similar question in the class the other day where people were like, can you work on games if you don't play games? Theoretically, yes, but it's going to be harder to connect with the crowd because half of my game meetings with game developers is just us geeking out about games and recommending games to each other and like talking about what games we started out playing like back in the 90s or 80s or whatever, you know, like talking about our favorite game scores and, you know, you kind of nerd out together and then you connect through that and it's the same with directors you nerd out together about movies and film scores and all that stuff um, so I think it would be much harder to connect with people if you don't actually consume the thing that you are making um, and also how do you learn the language of it you know how do you understand game soundtracks if you never play games how do you understand the language of film if you never watch movies I think that would just be incredibly difficult to do and you'd probably not love it <laughs> um, have you written any radio friendly pop songs I have I have written a couple of songs for some of the movies that I've done um, some who which were moderately successful like moderately I mean like a hundred thousand streams or something but nothing that was like a smash hit or something What's the best way to find an agent? I have a video about agents and managers, but you don't find an agent. The agents find you mostly. Um, or you're recommended by someone inside the agency, but they can't be hired because they work on commission. So they get a percentage of your, of your fee. And so since they work on commission, they obviously only bet on talent that they think they can make money with in the future, either now or in the future. But they have to, you know, 
That's why they often only take on clients that already have a certain steady flow of work. Um, Because they, you know, they kind of need a little bit of a guarantee that all of their work is not just done for free. (laughs) Because they only get paid when you get paid. Mac Studio or Mac Mini? I don't know. Ask a Mac user. I am on PC. Uh... My mentor swears by sticking to a portfolio of music in your own style, your own voice. Do you think it's better to be true to yourself or bend to making music in the style of others? Um, I mean, sometimes you have to bend, but I would uh, concur that um, having your own voice is more important, especially with the dawn of AI. It's going to be more and more important for starters. Um, But also... Like I said in pitches, it's the thing that sticks out in the crowd. If you just sound like everybody else, then it's going to be really hard to get people to actually um, be interested. How do you develop a consistent discipline to compose on a daily basis? Uh, Routine. Routine is the key for me. I have to do it first thing in the morning before I do anything else. Because if I start doing other shit, I will never ever sit down later and do it. Because composing is the hardest thing for me to do uh, in the day. And so it's the first thing I should do when I don't have decision making fatigue yet. It's really difficult for me later in the day to make difficult decisions because I'm tired. Um, And to really, you know, sit down and do the difficult thing. In the morning, it's kind of easy for me to do it first thing. And since I made it a routine, I don't think about it. You know, you have to develop it to be such a habit, I think. That it's not a question, like there is no option for me to not sit down unless it's the weekend and I want to take a day off. Um, but the the key for me is to just make it an everyday thing, make it the first thing I do. And so then I don't question it because it's just my routine. I get up, I go into the kitchen, I make the coffee and then I sit down at my desk and I start writing. Now what might happen is that it's a bad writing day. <laughs> Um, and so what uh, what happened is that like sometimes I just I, I try for an hour or two hours and nothing comes up you know and I know okay it's a bad writing day I don't try to force it then unless I'm on a really tight deadline I'm someone who then um, just gets up and does other stuff maybe I need another nap Maybe it's just a day to run errands. Maybe it's a day to do paperwork and accounting and taxes and all that shit. Maybe it's a day of cleaning my computers, cleaning my apartment, cleaning um, anything. Maybe it's, you know, a chore day. Maybe it's just a day that I have to take off, you know. Um, So I do play it by ear. I will have the discipline and routine to sit down, but sometimes if... It's not the day, it's not the day, and I will just do other maintenance tasks for that day and just take the rest of the day off and then just try the next day. So it also kind of helps to know that when I'm sitting down, there's the option of getting back up if it's not working, you know, to kind of give me the allowance, you know, to to kind of already have that in mind that I don't have to stay sitting here for the next eight hours. If it's not happening, I'll just stop. I think that helps me. Also blocking out hours and um, kind of setting an alarm for breaks and then forcing myself to take the breaks, that also helps. Because if there's like a countdown and you can see, okay, it's just like 15 more minutes until the break, it's so much easier to keep going than say when you don't schedule any breaks and then uh it's kind of this indefinite task that just goes on and on 
So setting endpoints also to the work usually helps me. Do you plan on learning more instruments? Yes, I do. I don't know which ones yet. I'm kind of flexible with that. Uh, already answered that. Do you have a celebratory routine after wrapping film? Um, sleep. <laughs> sleep. Playing video games. Uh, happy hour. Um, going on a bike ride to the beach. I don't know. Mostly just rest. Once you're done, you're really, you're really done. You just want to chill. Um, already answered that. Are composers that still lack some knowledge, they don't read all clefs, they didn't attend a music school, can't direct orchestra, automatically out of business? Well, if that were true, then half the composers would be out of business. No. Um, no, as long as you have team members that can cover up the, um, the uh, weaknesses, or you can you figure out a way to work around your weaknesses, um, it's fine. Like a lot of composers don't have all the knowledge. I don't have all the knowledge. Um, there are things that I would probably fix. Like if it's some, it's, if it's just like theoretical knowledge that can be acquired, I always think, why not? You know, um, might as well learn it, right? In case you need it. Better to know too much than not enough. But yeah, you're not automatically out of business. Might just be a little bit of a harder journey at times. have a lot of duplicate questions now. Um, do you record the full orchestra all together with the mock-up and headphones or is it more common to record sections with the mock-up and headphones and mix together later um personal choice also budget question like what's cheaper and what's in our budget to do uh, also depends on the location and the players um i prefer to record sections we call it striping. I have a video about that, actually. Sweetening and striping, I think I called or how film scores are recorded. Uh, most film scores are now recorded in sections, usually. Um, but there are still some composers who prefer the full orchestra altogether. I've done some of my scores like that, too. So um, you can do it if you have the right players in the right location and the right lineup for sure because if you record full orchestra you really need a full orchestra because you need to balance out the brass with enough strings so if you don't have the money to do that then striping might be better because then you can have a smaller string section and then just fix it in the mix later um, but either way it's like it's a creative question and a budget question I'm just skipping a bunch of questions that I have no opinion on, <laughs> really. Is it true that 95% of composers were composers' assistants? I don't know. Probably. 
maybe not 95 percent but a lot of them yeah a lot of them were basically apprentices of someone else um probably not 95 percent but probably like uh, definitely well over 50 percent for sure um probably like 75 percent i want to say off the top of my head um hard hard to say we we'd have to do proper research to find the actual number but yeah definitely the majority of film composers were composers assistants i mean even classical composers were very often composers assistants before them so it's it's a thing um what's the best neighborhood for a composer to live in la i don't know a safe neighborhood um some would say studio city because a lot of the studios are there, but then studios are kind of spread out as well. Because I'm close to Sony and Fox and semi-close to Paramount, but I'm really far away from Warner Brothers, Disney, and uh, whoever else, oh, Universal. Um, so it's kind of spread out to begin with. A lot of composers live in Santa Monica. A lot of composers work in Santa Monica. I don't know. I don't know. As long as it's um, a safe neighborhood, it doesn't really matter. Maybe avoid Hollywood just because it's very hard to get in and out of Hollywood. <laughs> That's just, it's also just a very <laughs> mixed part of town. Have you considered switching to Nuendo since you've been working on games? Not yet, no. Um, might consider it in the future. I don't know yet. What is the most boring task that composers do? Oh, probably stem printing. The only thing more boring would probably be sampling. Oh my god. It's the worst. Anyone who does sampling full time, hats off to you. I just, no, 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 no. <laughs> That is not something I want to get back into. That was just mind-blowingly boring. Um, not just the recording sessions, but the editing and the looping and tuning and all that stuff. Oh my god, no. Um, but yeah, followed by stem printing, I want to say, is the most boring task, for sure. Have you considered making a Google Sheet tracker template available? Oh yeah, I should probably put that on buy me a coffee, huh? Yeah, I will do that when I have a moment. Um, already had that. Have you used a vPro server on one computer? No, I have not. I've always had two or like in my professional life, I've always had two. Um, so yeah. Um, how do you make sure that your original composition hasn't already been composed by someone else? The music business is full of copyright lawsuits. Well, I mean, writing tonal music is just tricky because someone's definitely already written it at some point. Um, I'm not sure there's a way to check it. If I um, am un unsure, I will definitely send it to team members that are also on the project and just be like, have you heard this before? Because it feels familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. And if they have never heard it, then I'm just going to go ahead and use it. If the production has never heard it, like someone at some point would stop you if you're ripping off a <laughs> very famous piece without knowing it. Because a lot of people will hear this before it goes out into theaters or onto streaming services. Like hundreds of people will hear this before it goes out. So someone would stop you if it already exists at some point. Um, but also, from what I understand, you have to only prove that you didn't intentionally rip it off. Like the people accusing you of plagiarism have to prove that you intentionally, you know, took from their music. Um, which should be pretty hard to prove. But also usually these things settle outside of um, court anyway by just like sharing cue sheet and stuff, whatever, or giving credit to the other composer, 
which is probably what I would do anyway. Like if someone came to me and said, hey, you wrote a piece and it sounds exactly like my piece, I would probably just be like, oh, um, that was not intentional. But how about we, you know, give you some cue sheet on the cues where, you know, it's it's using the same melody or something. Um, but yeah, I haven't had that yet that someone would, you know, do that. So I haven't had any lawsuits yet. And I've certainly written uh, themes that felt kind of familiar. But as long as it's not exactly the same and you can prove that you didn't rip it off, that's also why I like having that, um, having that uh, communication with my team members where I'm asking so that I have that proof that I did check and nobody could pinpoint it and so that's how we went with it like that would be good proof to show in case of a lawsuit to show that I did check and that nobody heard the similarity and you know so I don't know but yeah there's no way to make 100% sure I think that you didn't rip it off intentionally rip it off again you have to prove that there was intention to commit plagiarism all right um <laughs> any more walk around outside vlogs coming up yes I actually have them already scripted and planned out it's just too hot right now to do it because I'll just get a sunburn <laughs> But yes, I've already planned a trip to the marina to walk around the boats. Um, then I got to find some other. I keep wanting to do a hike in the mountains, but I have to do that in winter or late fall because in summer it's too hot to go into the hills or the mountains. But the view is really nice. And I want to take, you know, my good camera for once and actually take some really nice footage from up there. But also, I don't know how well I would do walking up a mountain and talking. I'm not that fit. Do you think music library work can lead to getting some Hollywood film composing gigs? It's not common. Maybe it has happened for someone probably for someone but it's not common because in music libraries you don't interact with the studios or with the filmmakers so you're just kind of an, a name on a sheet of paper to them and that's not really helpful in getting hired because people hire people um, so unless you can make genuine connections with the filmmakers or the studio, which most music libraries will try and prevent because they like to be the middleman. That's how they make money, right? Uh, they have the connections to place your music. So they are basically the gatekeepers. So they would not want you to necessarily have that connection. I'm sure it has happened for someone, but I don't. It's not a very common thing, I don't think. Do you have any old compositions saved from days before success? Yes, I do. Uh, and they will never see the light of day. <laughs> How did you get rid of your German accent? Some people say I still have a German accent. Um, but yeah, practice. It's the answer to everything, my guys. Practice. <laughs> you record yourself and you practice. Would you be willing to speak of errors, things you would do differently? Oh, I would set boundaries much sooner. I would not put up with a lot of things and I would work less hard. <laughs> That's such an odd thing to say, I would work less hard.
But the reality is that I feel like I could have probably put in half the amount of hours that I put in and half the effort and still gotten to exactly the same spot in my career. Um, a lot of wasted nights, a lot of wasted nerves, a lot of wasted health, you know, I'm just like a lot of things I've missed because I was working. I wouldn't do that again. I would just be like, you know what? It's not that important. Um, Cause at the like you take it so seriously at the beginning, and now that I'm a little further in, I'm like, we're just making movies. Like everybody needs to chill the fuck out. We're just making movies, or and video games. Like, it's entertainment. It's not. We're not saving lives here. We're not like doing open heart surgery. Okay. Like nobody's gonna die if we don't. Uh, you know, pull the 16 hour day on a Sunday, uh, except for the people pulling the 16 hour day that will slowly work themselves into an early grave. So I just started seeing things a little more in perspective, you know, like a lot of things just aren't that important <laughs> to stress out about. But I guess that just comes with age to be just more chill about a lot of things and to not care about so many pointless things it's like when you get, grow older you kind of remove things in your life that are just obstacles and you just remove things that aren't contributing to your happiness and that aren't contributing to your health and that just aren't contributing anything good to your life um so yeah that would be one thing i would try and balance my life a little sooner and I would set boundaries instantly I still have trouble with that sometimes just telling people no this is how far I'm gonna go and and this is it uh, so I'm getting better about that but yeah putting up with people's bullshit uh, I, I would do that less now but I guess that's the same for everybody right as you get older it's just you filter that out and you can also you can kind of afford to filter that out you know it's not like at 25 I could have afforded to do that because I needed the work and I needed to put up with a lot of nonsense because I had no power so anyway yeah already answered that already answered that already answered that oh boy I am old and afraid I'll never even have even one song recognized or recorded what can I do I mean the recognition part is unfortunately not in our control like the same way I don't get to decide which of my scores are heard by anyone and which ones are just gonna die a very quick death you know the same way a filmmaker does not get to choose which one of the movies they make are gonna be seen and which ones are just nobody goes to um but recording I mean um that that seems more solvable because that's just a money question so um maybe a kickstarter or a gofundme or something um you know anything like that to get the funds and then um you know and then record put it out there and maybe it'll be recognized or maybe not but we have no control over that unfortunately um that's that's the unfortunate reality what games have you done the music for so the first games I worked on um, was League of Legends but that was more in like an assistant capacity not in a writing capacity supervising sessions and doing sheet music and stuff like that then I worked a bit on Halo 5 I, I did some custom samples and some like additional percussion programming and stuff um, and then I did co-writes with Klaus Bedelt on um, some mobile games one's called Lords Mobile one is called Castle Clash and one is called Galaxy Mobile 
and um I've done some more more work now composition work for Riot Games China and for Honor of Kings by Tencent Games and now I'm working on a VR game that I can't talk about yet. Um don't have an answer to that. So everybody's so concerned about music notation. <laughs> um I guess one confusion I have about the whole question like do you think I'm lost if I don't know music notation it's not that hard to learn is, is there's not that many if you can read the alphabet you can also learn to read sheet music it's not like it's easier actually you just have to practice it that's the like I was struggling for a really long time with the bass clef and with the alto clef because I started out playing flutes in the treble clef so I was really fluent in treble clef but um, I was struggling a lot with the other clefs but it's just a question of 10 minutes a day to like this is a very solvable problem if this is something you guys are worried about music notation like that's a very very solvable problem with just investing like 10 minutes a day into learning it and then after a year you can actually do it um, so that's not really if this is a concern, it's a solvable concern <laughs> that you can solve with just like practice. Um, there are plenty of online tools that can just do that. All right. I'll pick like one last question, but we're coming up on five hours and that's going to be enough because I have to get back to work, I have to eat lunch and then get back to work. Um, a lot of these are duplicate questions anyway. Oh boy. Um, do you usually find a job sponsor first, then ask for a visa? Or do you come with a tourist visa, find a job, and then switch cards? Is the only way to get sponsored is to become insistent? Uh, you're not allowed to look for work on a tourist visa. You can get banned for up to, two, up to 10 years from entering the country if you do that. Uh, you're also actually not allowed to do internships, as far as I know, on a tourist visa. You're not allowed to do anything work related on a tourist visa. So, and sure, many a person has violated that, but if you get caught, there are very dire consequences. So I would not recommend that. Um, it's student visa, or I think there's also an exchange visa or a green card, or you come as a spouse, or you have someone who wants to hire you already and then sponsors an artist visa or an H-1B visa. But you have to find the sponsor before you enter the United States. All right. Do you have any new composition videos planned? Yes, I do. I've actually scripted out a bunch, but they're kind of, they're very time consuming to make. Um, so it always takes a lot of time. Um, but yes, I will make more composition and orchestration videos and more mock-up videos and all that stuff. All right. If you're having a good day, how many hours might you spend writing? Depends on the deadline. I prefer actually to just compose for four hours and then do mock-ups for a couple hours. But if I'm having a good day, I could, I could probably get to like eight to 12 hours 
But then I really have to be in the zone and really excited and energetic on that day. Otherwise, it's not happening. <laughs> if you work with notation, do you use Sibelius or Dorico? Uh, I'm using Sibelius, sort of, but I have not actually used it in a while. I'm gonna actually have to notate a couple parts soon for the last front, but um, I have not ever touched Dorico, so I don't know. Um, but I don't use notation software often enough to actually, um, you know, to actually prefer any of them. I started out on Finale and then I switched to Sibelius. Uh, but, you know, now it's all done by my orchestrator anyway, so it's not really, um, it's not really a thing for me to be concerned about. A streaming service is really worth, actually worth it when it comes to royalties. Streaming services as in music streaming or like film streaming? Film streaming, yes. Um, I'm still getting like solid like five figures from my little streaming films um it's just more in traditional tv and traditional and i'm pretty sure like people with bigger titles are getting more money from streaming and it's been going up definitely music streaming i mean i get like 50 bucks a month or something it's not <laughs> it's not making you rich but i still want those 50 bucks a month so <laughs> So I'm still going to do it. Um, you know, that's a nice happy hour right there. Um, but yeah, it's currently I don't think a lot of people are getting rich off of royalties unless you have huge international releases that both stream but also go to theaters and then also play on traditional TV. Um, yeah. All right. How did you practice ear training? Um, depends on what kind of ear training. And um, that's the last question. <laughs> no more questions. It's five hours exactly now. Um, how do you practice ear training? I was struggling with ear training for a while, actually. Um, for me, something that always helps is gamifying stuff. Finding apps that just turn stuff that I don't enjoy doing into a game, basically. Um, and ear training as in theoretical ear training that's just a lot of it's the same as learning notation just do it for 10 minutes every day and at first it's like it makes no difference and then wait a couple of months and all of a sudden you realize that you can hear so many things all of a sudden it's just really um a question of continuity um in terms of mixing it's a question of like there's a couple of i think there's one called sound gym or ear gym or something um there's also one that we started in college that was called golden ears there's a bunch of um tools that you can learn to start hearing frequencies which i started finding really um helpful when uh mixing and with you know refining my production in general being able to learn how to properly EQ and hear frequencies and hear frequency clashes, learning to hear different timbres and, and that sort of thing and being able to pinpoint it. Um, so uh, yeah, I would just look for tools online. There are many apps or websites that help you with that stuff. And then I would differentiate between musical ear training, which is super helpful to analyze music and very quickly distinguish between things musically and be able to hear pitches and rhythms very easily. Um, and between mixing ear training, which is more about frequencies and frequency spectrums and all that sort of thing and learning how to EQ and make room for something. Um, and both are, I want to say, equally important because there's no point in having the greatest compositions on earth if you can't also produce them so that people can actually hear them right all right this is it we're done <laughs> that was over 200 questions <laughs> that 
was a long Q&A. Um, but it felt necessary considering how many um, subscribers we have. And considering it's my anniversary, I'm going to have a beer now. It's the afternoon. Um, and probably a happy hour later. So I got to get some work done. Um, and I'm going to read through the whole chat as well. <laughs> I kind of missed most of it, but I'll read through it for sure. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for sticking with me for... We had like consistently around 200 people sticking with me for five goddamn hours. Are you guys not tired of hearing me ramble on? Jesus. Anyway, um, I'll see you guys next week in another video about sample libraries, what sample libraries I've added. And then I also already recorded a rant about subscription models, so that's going to be more of an opinion piece. And then I'll see what next videos I'm going to record either some stuff outdoors or some more composition stuff or some hardware software reviews whatever all right i'll get back to my day and you guys get back to your day um and i'll i'll see you guys in the next live stream someday <laughs> we're not gonna do this every month but someday um maybe at the next ten thousand or something we can do this again all right. All right. I hope this was helpful and uh, go practice. <laughs> <laughs>